Good morning. Thank you, thank you. Shine the light, shine the light on me. All the light. Well, a very good morning to you. Uh, let me first and foremost, I think, apologize for a delayed start that we're having this morning. I know that uh, we indicated on the program that we're going to start at uh, 9 o'clock sharp, but we wanted to make sure uh, that everybody's present before we commence with uh, this very, very imp um, important gathering. My name is Ricardo Knagosev. I'll be directing the ceremony for today on behalf of the Hans Seidel Foundation. So if I say anything out of line, uh, please uh, do speak to my colleagues at Hans Seidel Foundation. They carry all the liability for everything I'm going to say today. <laughs> Just <laughs> uh, nonetheless, before we get with the program of the day, can we please rise for the National and African Union Anthems?
Thank you. I think it always warms my heart when I hear uh, the, the African Union anthem. And I think it's, we, we are one of us. It's four countries that uh, played at our official events. I've started noticing that even at uh, education inst institutions, uh, they also start playing the African Union anthem. And I think it's important that from a very young age, we start instilling those ideals of, of African unity. And hopefully that we're going to have that uh, uh, free trade as well as free movement across uh, Africa. Uh, for Africans and those, of course, that reside here as well. But nonetheless, we're gathered here, I think, for a very, very important conversation uh, in the midst of, uh, well, bad news that was received. I think uh, the, the, the one uh, member of parliament that did not get any sleep must be Honorable Carla Schlettmann because the, the Fitch rating just came out late last night. It wasn't really good news, and I saw him, you know, fighting with the, uh, the Twitter crowd that never actually sleeps. So I'm hoping that... He might have had some rest before this morning. So in the midst of this climate, of this uh, economic news that you're receiving, of course, on one hand, IMF saying that we might be expecting positive growth next year. Uh, the Bank of Namibia saying otherwise. Of course, Fitch coming out last night. It's, it's very difficult to have a conversation of this nature uh, in the midst of this uh, the, the economic climate. The current state of sustainable natural resource management in Namibia and ways to unlock its bioeconomic potential is what we're going to be focusing on for today. The official recognition of... Uh, Protocol will be done by Honorable Professor Dr. Peter Kashavivi. So allow me to just recognize protocol before I set a few house rules for uh, today. Just to remind you, please, can we put all our cell phones on silent, if it's possible? I know that we are all very, very busy people. Uh, and if we can keep the movement a bit minimal so that we can just get to the crux of the issues that we'll discuss, focus, and have all the contributions from everybody present here, that will be of utmost importance. The lavatory is immediately on your right as you step out um, at the door, at the back. If you need any assistance, please uh, do uh, make sure to just speak to one of the secretariat members that are on either side of the door, representing the Hans Seidel Foundation and, of course, some of the partner organizations. I think before we continue and just take a look at the program for this morning, I'll be doing a disservice if I don't thank our partners in setting an event of this nature together. Of course, the organizer Hans Seidel Foundation, um, in partnership with the Parliament of the Republic of Namibia. The British High Commission, of course, represented by the highest office, as I mentioned. The recognition of protocol will be formally done by our Speaker of Parliament. The Embassy of Spain in Namibia. Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, FAO. The European Union. The Embassy of, of Finland, here in Ventuk. Of course, the German Embassy, as well as uh, GIZ, who has been a long-term development partner of Namibia. The UNDP, and of course, recognizing anybody else that, might, that I might have uh, left out in my haste to thank everybody as we start off. A quick look at the program. There might have been one or two changes. I think the most notable one is that we will not have a keynote speech, and we're just going to get straight to the order of the day. So welcoming remarks by the Speaker of Parliament, Honorable Professor Dr. Picha Kashavivi. That will be followed by the introduction to the conference objectives and, of course, outputs. What are the expected outcomes uh, of this conference? If you look at the program, of course, it's a bit loaded, so it's important that we zoom in on certain objectives that we set for ourselves at the beginning and see whether we've achieved those at the end of the day. That will be done by the resident representative of Hans Seidel Foundation, HSF, uh, Dr. Clemens von Dodre. That will immediately be followed by... Kenya's efforts and experiences with bioeconomy, integration into livelihood improvement, looking at different strategies for food security and sustainable development in the face of uh, climate change. And really it has uh, become an issue of human security, especially during times like this, when we have to make sure that there is enough water, there is enough energy, especially uh, for developmental states such as ours. So I could never overemphasize the importance of this particular case study. And that will be uh, brought to us by Professor Dr. Gilbert, Mbakanduru, or from the Department of Geography in Karatina University in Kenya. We'll have a short tea and coffee break. And after that, we'll have the first focused session. And that will be on the current state of agriculture and climate, uh, smart ways towards food security. The scene will be set by Sakaria Ngekemwa, the Chief Executive Officer of AgriBank. 
I don't need to overemphasize the importance that AgriBank plays, um, particularly in making sure that we actualize our developmental goals in the area of agriculture and sustainable food production. Session keynote will be Honorable Minister Alfius Ngarusep, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Water and Forestry. And that will be followed by a climate smart and innovative approach in agriculture the region, at the region of Mercia um, example in Spain. So we'll get that example from Spain from Dr. Miguel Angel Fernandez Carrillo, agricultural engineer, a management technician on plant health uh, for the Ministry of Water, Agriculture, uh, Livestock, Fisheries and Environment and Autonomous Region of course, there in Spain. And right after that, we'll have a short a panel discussion that will be focusing on the current state of agriculture and climate smart ways towards food security. And then, of course, uh, a short lunch break that will be followed by session two that looks at the sustainability of forests and its econ um, uh, ecosystem services. Sustainability of forests, of course, quite a very, very important one. And I think uh, it's important to also point out partners like the GIZ, uh, through the debushing advisory service that has really, really been trying to uh, assist us in terms of making sure that we meet these goals around having sustainable forests, especially uh, with a biomass value addition that has been, of course, on the mainstream uh, national agenda over the last few years. The scene will be set uh, by Dr. Vara from uh, the Namibia University of Science and Technology, NAST. We'll also have Melissa Rousseau and Dr. Niels Boland from the Royal Museum of Central Africa, Belgium, also joining us uh, to set the scene. After that, the keynote speech by our Minister of Environment and Tourism, Honorable Pohamba Shiveta. And that will be followed by uh, forest certification, a tool to ensure sustainable management of timber resources uh, in South Africa. And Craig Norris, uh, Forest Technology Manager at NCT, Forestry Cooperative Limited in South Africa will be giving us that insight. I think this is a very, very important one, looking at the fact that we have a constitutional uh, imperative to also empower our communities uh, to make sure that they are part of the sustainable development um, and protection of our biodiversity in our ecosystem. So I'm also, of course, looking forward to that contribution. That will be followed by observations on sustainable uh, silver cultural practice in Finland. Uh, Henrik uh, Jana, a marketing manager, uh, at Risutech in Finland will give us that insight and uh, that will immediately be followed by a panel discussion on the sustainability of forests and its ecosystem services. And like I mentioned, we've got uh, quite a mouthful for today, so I hope we can have a very, very good and focused uh, conversation. And the final session will be session three, of course, uh, zooming in again in another focused area, integrated management of uh, freshwater fisheries especially uh, in a country such as ours that's struggling, of course, uh, to get a consistent rainfall patterns over the last few years. It's important for us to investigate what are some of the issues and some of the options and opportunities uh, that we had. I know that, of course, there's a lot of young and upcoming farmers that are talking about things around aquaculture and hydroponics, etc. But we are yet to see major investments uh, in that area. And I'm, of course, also excited to have AgriBand here. They might have uh, to touch on one or two things in terms of what could be some facilities uh, available for those up-and-coming farmers. But in terms of that, Dr. Clinton Hay, a zoologist from the University of Namibia, will be joining us to set the scene. That will be followed by a keynote speech by um, Honorable uh, Bernard Essel, the Minister of Fisheries and Marine Resources, followed by a presentation on sustainable freshwater fishery management and overseas country example uh, from the UK. Dr. Louise Langer will join us, uh, Business Development Manager from Center for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Sciences in the United Kingdom. And that will, of course, be followed by uh, a moderated panel discussion on integrated management of freshwater fisheries. And of course, a very brief uh, closing session. Closing remarks by Honorable Rusa Joyce Nangula, Member of Parliament, a National Council and member of the Namibia Conservation of Parliamentary Caucus. And of course, a vote of thanks by Honorable Sophia Swartz, a member of Parliament as well, Chairperson of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Management of Natural Resources. And of course, we'll have a brief cocktail because you would have spent the whole day discussing something so important. So without wasting any time, please uh, allow me to give a round of applause and welcome. Our Honourable Speaker of Parliament, Professor Dr. Peter Kashavivi, for the welcoming remarks.
Thank you very much. I was caught as I was just having a, a quick word with a, a former Deputy Prime Minister, Dr. Lipetina Madeira, who phoned, wanted to know about this important event. Um, my job is very simple. It's a, a simple task, and it is to welcome you, all of you, individually and collectively. And I will start by acknowledging honorable ministers and deputy ministers, honorable members of parliament who are all here, members of the diplomatic corps, distinguished invited religious, traditional and community leaders, distinguished representatives of international and local civil society organizations, uh, esteemed captains of industry, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. I have a particular privilege to warmly welcome you all to the National Conference on Current State of Sustainable Natural Resources Management in Namibia and Ways to Unlock Its Bioeconomy Potential. First of all, let me take this opportunity to thank our development partners, many of them who have been actively involved in assisting and promoting this important event. I would like to say we are extremely grateful to all of them for joining hands with us to try and address issues of national concern. But I would like to make use of this opportunity to um, single out one particular person and that is Dr. Clemens von Dodera, the resident representative of Hans Settle Foundation in Namibia, who have been uh, extremely instrumental in um, talking to all of us, and many of us who had something to do with this event, talking about um, the need to think about organizing an event on this scale to talk about some of the critical issues that this conference is going to deal with. We started in a very simple way by convening uh, with the help of the, one of the st parliamentary standing committees responsible for national resources uh, to, and brought together a number of colleagues uh, from parliament, from the academic institutions, research, etc., to brainstorm about an event of this magnitude. And it is due to his persistence and absolute commitment that today, this morning, we managed to come together here. Thank you very much for that absolute commitment. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this conference comes at a critical time. Not only are we experiencing the worst drought in the history of our country, basically going back 90 years, but also an economic depression. For more than two years, our economy has severely affected by economic downturn. More than 60% of the population of Namibia depend directly or indirectly from agriculture. Uh, forestry as well as freshwater fishery to maintain their livelihoods, particularly in communal areas. The communities rely on subsistence farming, fishing, using firewood as a main source of energy. And an increasing 
poor population relying on natural resources. In most of our communal areas, there's a cause a great deal of environmental challenges which uh, interact also with each other. So this has been witnessed a great deal across the country and it is for that reason uh, the government have declared a state of emergency as a way of dealing with this particular drought that have affected the country in, in a big way. Some of the impact of land degradation include reduction in agricultural productivity, reduction in water quality and quantity, as well as soil er er erosion, and increase flooding have been experienced in the past, particularly in some parts of our, our country. The degradation de 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 of land is caused by both natural as well as human induced factors. In many areas of Namibia, the effect of human activities such as overgrazing are quite visible. You can speak to a number of our farming communities and they will tell you how this has actually affected the country tremendously. In addition, we all remember the reports in the newspapers and in social media about cutting of trees in various parts of the country. And that has also taken place in a much increase, on a much increased um, scale. There have been growing there, <clears throat> uh, this has been happening in, for many years, if not for centuries, and, and that basically is also affecting uh, the, 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 the productivity of, of the, in, a, in the agricultural sector. Now there are <clears throat> basically this, this idea of cutting uh, some of these trees on, on a much, ma ma massive scale have actually have, have drawn the attention of the me me media as well as the government to look for ways and means of basically uh, uh, redressing this aspect of development. Um, the, this kind of development uh, do take place um, and without basically thinking about the impact as well as the fact that we have to begin to realize that if we do this thing, uh, it would affect the country in a much more uh, damaging way. And the damage for local communities, the economy and the environment is massive. And it is for that reason that the government is taking stock and taking appropriate action, basically, to change this particular habit on the part of our various communities in the area that has been been of a particular concern. S similar stories uh, we have heard about our freshwater fisheries along the Zambezi River and the Kavango River as well as the Kunene River. And from elsewhere, um, this has become a story of great concern that attracted the attention of the uh, local authorities as well as the government at the national level. Given these challenges, the concept of sustainable management of our natural resources appeals to most of all of us in the country that we need to, do, to think about tomorrow and we need to take the necessary uh, step. As we all are aware, Namibia is a semi-arid to arid country concerning Climate change, Namibia is the most sensitive country in the sub-Sahara Africa, if not the entire African continent. And therefore, we should know better and prepare better for, the, for all these obvious reasons. Safeguarding our natural resources, not only for us, but particularly for our future generations, should be 
at the center of our work. And it is for that reason that Parliament is particularly uh, concerned and looking for ways and means of enlisting the support, the cooperation of stakeholders, both at home and abroad, in order for us to do something and address this particular issue head on. Sustainability, however, does not call for prevention of consumption, but rather environmentally safe wise consumption with value addition and environmental safeguards. It is therefore my sincere hope that at the, at the end of this engagement between experts, policymakers, lawmakers, government representatives, captains of industry, civil society representatives, essentially, essentially everyone here in the room, we should have an idea. We should have an idea of challenges around climate, smart agriculture, sustainable forest management, and integrated fresh water fisheries for Namibia. But let us not stop there. Every crisis also allows for critical reflection on what should be done differently. As we look back, we draw some critical lessons. As we look to the future, we take stock and we draw some lessons that are absolutely critical to equip us to do better and to do things differently from what we have experienced in the past. I'm just as hopeful that by tonight, by this afternoon, by tonight, we will have heard more about some of the opportunities that helps us to forge a way forward in the right direction on sustainable natural resource management. I'm saying this because I'm confident, judging from the list of a number of speakers who have joined us on this occasion, that we will be listening carefully to hear from them and to see what suggestions, recommendations are going to be offered that will help us to sharpen an agenda that we improve on some of the areas where we have not been doing so well. Allow me to conclude by saying that I'm convinced that this conference will also create a room for further engagements. I also hope that all stakeholders can further identify avenues for on capacity development to improve the livelihoods, particularly in rural areas. There are some positive developments. As a weekend farmer, I uh, visited uh, a neighbor uh, and I, I saw some innovations. Um, the farm is totally overgrazed, like my own. But the farmer have basically cut down on the number of livestock to a management level. And he have introduced new innovations where he's actually growing grass almost sufficient to keep his animal in good condition and have surplus to sell to his neighbor, including myself. So these are some of the, the new innovation that we are witnessing that can form part of the new methodologies that we need to adopt for the future. So all is not lost, but I think we need to continuously innovate to explore what is possible under the circumstances and taking into account of the fact that Namibia is actually a semi-arid country surrounded by two major deserts, the Namib Desert, the Kalahari Desert. Sometimes we overlook some of those factors of life and we simply have to come to terms with that. Um, Namibia has made a commitment uh, 
to the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. Climate change is something that we really have to, to deal with and to come to terms with. Indeed, targeted interventions uh, will help us to make a significant impact towards these targets. And, and this is one of the issues that I'm, I'm hopeful uh, this engagement will touch on and help improve on some of the recommendations and make sure they are implementable. Once again, you are most welcome. Um, feel welcome and um, we are looking forward as a parliament, as a country, to the outcome of this important engagement. I now take this opportunity to declare this conf national conference officially open, and I thank you. I really have to be on my best behavior today. Uh, nonetheless, it's time to uh, take a quick look at the introduction of, to the conference. Uh, I think much has been said already, but what we expect, of course, from uh, Dr. Von Dodre is to give us clear objectives and outputs. So what is it that we expect to achieve at the end of today? Please uh, give a warm round of applause to the resident representative of the Hans Seidel Foundation. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear representatives from Parliament, from the Namibian government, um, dear uh, excellencies uh, from the diplomatic uh, corps, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the protocol has been absorbed, uh, ob um, observed already, so I uh, won't go into too much detail uh, further. Actually, I should have listened to my team um, uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday when they said, you know what, don't prepare a speech, you do the best when you don't. Um, and I actually had a, pre a speech prepared and now my computer has given in, so I can't even read from my speech now. So uh, I have to improvise now a little bit, but that's okay, I hope. Um, now, this conference actually um, has come somewhat a long way, um, already beginning of the year. Um, we saw some of the trends in terms of the drought, the economic crisis, and, and, and. And um, having spoken to a number of um, key players or uh, um, stakeholders in the natural resource management fraternity, I realized, okay, there is a reason, good reason to bring together um, people from the private sector, from civil society, together with representatives from government, from parliament, to engage and to learn more and to understand each other better um, on some of the challenges we are um, actually facing in this country right now. Agriculture is on its knees. Uh, the trees in the north are being cut in the thousands, um, and also fisheries um, are depleted um, like there is no tomorrow. All of that, I think, is a good reason to come together here today. And um, so, first of all, I would like to thank all of you to be present here. Um, to take time uh, in your busy schedules to make um, 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 to discuss um, climate smart agriculture, sustainable forest management, and integrated management of freshwater fisheries. I would like to thank all our international partners who have come on board to support this initiative um, to help to organizing this conference. And I actually have to commend my team, uh, um, but also all the partners who came on board to organize this conference because ultimately the budget for this conference was only approved end of July. So we only essentially had as of mid of August to really organize this conference. The fact that you all are here, that we have such a professional setup right now, I think is testament to the tremendous effort and work um, my colleagues and our, all our partners actually have put in. Um, I can mention here, obviously, um, our friends from the Namibian parliament, uh, from the Namibian government, who've been uh, supportive. But uh, in particular, I would like to also highlight the support of the Namibian Nature Foundation, which has come on board particularly for the freshwater fishery session to organize that, to help us um, to identify the right speakers 
um, and, and um, contributions for today. I would like to also commend um, the Embassy of Spain for uh, bringing in an expert from the region of Murcia in Spain to talk about arid agriculture. I would like to commend the Finnish Embassy for bringing in a forestry expert um, on a, from a technical point of view. Um, and I would like to commend the British High Commission for bringing in a freshwater expert from the UK. All those experts are not meant, here, are not meant to lecture in any way, but rather to provide, um, to t tell us their story. What kind of challenges were they facing um, um, in, 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 in that particular context? Um, and how did they overcome those obstacles to create a better environment and to move forward? And f so for us, it's not, uh, they are not here to lecture, but rather to learn from them what they've done to overcome those challenges and to then move forward. Um, I would like to also thank uh, the GIZ for also coming on board on a very short notice um, to provide, for instance, the conference folders and uh, other material um, so that we also have to uh, can carry some of the information also uh, physically back home. But of obviously a lot of the information will also be part then of what has been communicated to you and to myself. Um, and uh, there are messages also hopefully will be, which will, stu will be stuck in our brains and we can then move forward from there. Um, also I would like to um, thank our friends from the PFC, a forestry certification uh, mechanism. Um, the expert here will also talk about that a little bit more in detail. Um, last but not least, obviously our international organizations, FAO and UNDP, having them on board together also with the European Union, I think also helps a lot to, to give weight to this conference. Um, and um, so I would like to also acknowledge their support. What do we want with this conference? Well, um, it has been partially already mentioned by um, the Honourable Speaker that we want to bring people together uh, from the different fraternities. And um, in July, and that was one of the uh, reasons why we said, okay, well, let's really push for this, we were able to organise a um, parliamentary public engagement in Parliament on the state of forestry in Namibia. We've heard all about um, the media reports um, in the beginning of the year and end of last year about uh, some of the legal slash illegal loggings taking place in the north and uh, the hundreds of trucks which have actually left the north to the harbour of Wolfish Bay um, and then be the timber being exported to the Asian markets, particularly China. Now, um, this parliamentary public engagement actually turned out to be a great success and many of the parliamentarians were uh, quite grateful, uh, very grateful for having had this opportunity to get in touch with experts from the field and to learn firsthand what kind of impact it actually had or has um, in terms of the local ecology, um, the social um, co um, cohesion and, um, um, over there, um, but also economic, the economic impacts. So it actually is just an, an, a natural evolution that we are here gathered today. And so what, are, what is the objective? Well, is to come together to talk about those challenges, but also to look at um, some of the opportunities um, which Namibia has. So we just have to look at them and we have to address them and maybe also find ways to make them a reality. Um, and I really hope also that this conference is only the beginning. The beginning that we engage on more targeted um, ev um, deliberations, future conferences, workshops, etc., to focus on the specific sectors or even sectors within agriculture, within forestry, and, and, and. Um, allow me to now conclude also, um, the title actually um, also speaks about sustainability. And as we all know, sustain sustainability, the term, is being used quite inflationary in many ways. Often people relate that to um, environmental sustainability. But sustainability consists of three pillars, and I have them here. It's the environment, it's social, and it's the economy. And those three pillars are there for a reason. Because if our world wants to be uh, maintained in the long term, we need to make sure that we strike a balance. Otherwise, what's going to happen to our planet Earth? It's going to fall off or it's going to collapse. Now, in many places, we see often that they 
push actually for the economy. So what happens if I do that? I break the glass. <laughs> well, that is in a very illustrative way what can happen. <laughs> um, what happens if we push the environment too much at the expense of social um, 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 issues or social affairs? Well, the ball is going to fall off. So I think this illustrates very nicely we need those three pillars and we need to strike a balance to move forward, um, not only here in Namibia, but globally. And I think this is why also the sustainable development goals are so important. And this conference also, I think, will contribute to further discussions on how we can, what we can do here in Namibia to achieve the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, don't worry about that, Doug. I think, I think we can handle that during the break. Uh, but the illustration has been made. Sometimes uh, it must be that colorful to make a point, yeah? Nonetheless, like the good doctor has said, I think we know what the issues are, and, and then we could spend the whole day detailing and pointing out what some of the problems are. But really what we're here for is to look at case studies and, of course, also understand how we can solve some of the challenges uh, that we have. So for the first one, uh, we are going to look at Kenya's efforts and experiences with bioeconomy, uh, integration into livelihood improvements, uh, strategies, of course, for food security and sustainable development in the face of climate change. Please uh, give a warm round of applause to Professor Dr. Gilbert Mbakanduru from the Department of Geography at the Karatina University in Kenya. The speaker, the, the speaker of uh, Namibian Parliament, members of uh, government here present, members of the diplomatic hall, and invited guests, fellow uh, academics, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, it's a great researcher as uh, in the area of environmental studies, where I am. Um, uh, a lecturer in Karatina University. Secondly, I have tried to look into the old um, uh, Karo presentations and summarize the whole area in the interest of time to mainly focus on bioeconomy, especially in view of my observations on what happens in Kenya as a researcher, as an academic, and was who is experiencing the ravages of climate change within our country. So I really appreciate the invitation I got here. Um, this is really, uh, this is the first time I've arrived in Namibia and I'm so grateful for the honor to be able to come and uh, uh, make a presentation this morning. Now, um, my presentation uh, to you, as you can see on the board, uh, is on Kenyan efforts, or rather Kenyan efforts and experience uh, with the bio, uh, bioeconomy integration into livelihoods uh, improvement strategies. Um, uh, that's what I want to present on. I come from Karatina University. It's a young university that uh, is located 165 kilometers, 15, uh, 165 kilometers from Nairobi or to the north uh, of Nairobi uh, if you arrive in Kenya and uh, 15 kilometers from Karatina town on the road to, uh, to Nyeri town. So you're very welcome if you came to Kenya to Karatina University. Uh, from Karatina University, we are, I see Mount Kenya from my office. That, that is a photo I took from my office, and I wanted you to see it so that you may desire to come to Kenya. <laughs> and secondly, because you are talking about climate change, 
um, I have been required by my university to come up with a center for mountain ecosystem studies. And Mount Kenya constitutes a major laboratory for us, a field lab for us to study. And you're welcome to come and do these studies. We've already developed a master's degree program that is yet to be accredited. When it's through, I think I should send brochures to invite you there. Nevertheless, um, this is one of the uh, ecosystem that is very impacted by climate change at the moment. We used to have a lot of snow on top of Mount Kenya when I've been born, because I'm born um, in the part of Meru, the eastern side of the, the mountain. I used to see it totally covered by snow, but now it is only remaining about 30% of what used to exist some 20 years ago because of global warming. Uh, the rivers have continued to dry. Um, no longer do we have a snow melt, which used to feed most of the rivers that flow down. And this is impacting on our country a great deal because most of the hydroelectric power generation comes from the River Tana, the Seven Hawks Dams, which the river is going down because there's no longer snow supply, uh, water supply. As a consequence of that, we have um, uh, uh, downturn in economic development because uh, of the electricity supply and so the tariffs are becoming higher and cost of production are becoming higher. On the other hand, water for irrigation is also becoming a challenge and so the impact on Mount Kenya just alone is being felt almost everywhere in the country and I can almost say that in all other biomes and ecosystems of the country, climate change has not left any part untouched. And so when we think of uh, adapting and coming up with sustainable development, climate change becomes one of the major factors that we must consider on how people may adopt, uh, adapt to new um, ways of production that would be able to catapult development and economies into greater heights of prosperity, even within the harshness of the current scenarios. And therefore, I would want to focus on the main agenda of the day. And the first question I ask myself is what is uh, um, bioeconomy as applied in Kenya? I would want to first of all say that uh, bioeconomy as defined by many people, it may be defined in different ways, but in the Kenyan, um, but the, I make a choice uh, to define it in, a, in respect to the current uh, most recent definition that was given in the Bioeconomy Summit in Bahrain in 2018, uh, where it says the, that bioeconomy is the production, um, utilization, and uh, conservation of uh, um, these lights are affecting me so much. Can I use my computer, please? <laughs> Here. Yeah, I can't see what I'm, I want to say. Uh. Oh, yes, thanks. Now I can be faster with myself. Yeah, it means the production, um, utilization, and conservation of biological resources. And this also includes uh, the knowledge generated related to, uh, related to biological resources, the science of uh, managing and uh, utilizing these resources, uh, the technology and innovations that may be uh, developed or even could be used in uh, um, managing these uh, biological resources, as well as the products, uh, processes, and services in all economic sectors while focused on achieving sustainable development. Of course, sustainable development has been well and very uh, illustrated in a very captivating way by climate uh, in that we need to take into consideration that our economic focus, as we develop our economies, we need to ensure that they are sensitive to the socio-cultural uh, context in which these developments take place. We need to be very sensitive or rather focused on uh, how uh, development and economic development may impact on our environment for such uh, uh, in that case. Because in each case, the balance of our globe is dependent on a nice synergy 
and balance between all these um, kind of pillars. If one of them, as we have been already illustrated to, if one of them goes up or even lower than the others, then the balance will be tipped off and uh, the cloud will be, uh, uh, will be affected. I wouldn't want to say that uh, as a key feature of uh, bioeconomy in Kenya, uh, my observation is that it is extended in biomass production and processed beyond food, uh, feed uh, production for animals and all that, and fiber to include a range of other value added products. And in this case, it is a variety, there is a variety of applications that we have had in Kenyan context. In summary, I would say we've tried to come up with new ways of uh, producing uh, all other in, uh, uh, and, uh, innovations that uh, uh, are enhancing food production and food processing uh, and biosafety concerns to ensure that the country is uh, food secure. Food has become a major political issue in Kenya to the extent that it has become an election issue. In the last election, the president of the day and other politicians had to lead a campaign until food, uh, the government had to introduce even a package of unga or flour, maize flour, which had little relating to show that the people that they care are on supplying of food. So food is a major issue in Kenya because only 20% of the country is a high potential in terms of agricultural productivity Say 80% um, is mainly semi-arid and is water stressed. And at the moment with the ravages of climate change, most of the rivers are drying up. Water is becoming a major issue. And therefore there are conflicts between people in different areas, mainly not because of wealth or anything else, but because of water and water for production. And we need water to produce food because rain-fed agriculture is no longer reliable uh, it's no longer dependable, so we have to turn it out to look for water, and climate change is becoming a major threat to these systems. Um, the other thing is uh, in, in terms of health provisioning. We're trying to do a lot of research uh, on a lot of bioecosystems, um, in order to come up with medical uh, facilitations or medical innovations which could also be able to address some of the major uh, diseases that we face in our country and those kind of interface. We realize also with the lack of water uh, to provide HEP and the high cost of biofuels uh, or other fuels, we are also turning to biofuels and especially green energy uh, in order to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels which of course enhances climate change. And uh, in this case we are coming up with biofuels, we tapping into green energy uh, systems such as wind. We have established several uh, uh, um, farms or plants. We also are also relying on solar energy a lot. Uh, personally, my house, uh, my home is purely uh, solar energy powered in all systems except for, for the gate. Um, and, and, and this is an illustration to my people that we can tap green energy and still be able to, uh, to progress. Agroforestry has become a major practice. If you now came allowed Mount Kenya ecosystem and you went it through, um, you realize farmers have now embraced this practice of planting trees as a form of uh, enhancing uh, biodiversity uh, conservation within agroecosystems. And uh, we have very nice synergies where people grow plants together with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, with the crops within the same land. This is being practiced not only on agricultural ecosystem, but also in pastoral ecosystems, and also in tea and other areas, uh, plant integrated systems of uh, um, bioeconomy is very much encouraged in our contest. Oh, sorry, I thought I am moving with you, I'm moving alone. Um, why bioeconomy? I forgot I have something different here. Uh, why bioeconomy? Uh, Kenya, of course, has had to focus on bioeconomy because it has become an important driver of uh, future green and circular economic growth uh, that takes both societal as well as uh, environmental issues into consideration. Because it's not only about economy, it's not about development. Uh, we have 
as a country recognize that we also need to ensure all the other pillars are developed together. And therefore, the design of our economy, of the bioeconomy within Kenya and how it is being integrated within the economic system is so as to ensure that we create new jobs and improve livelihood opportunities without compromising possibilities um, uh, future possibilities, or other possibilities for future generations to be able to drive their systems. On this major point, the government of the day has actually come up with very major strategic uh, actions where it is trying to clear or other to, uh, to, to evacuate people from natural ecosystem like the Mao forest, where in the recent past, I think in the last two months, uh, we have seen a whole lot of activity trying to remove people who had invaded um, water towers and trying to invade natural forests and clear them in the name of their poor, then we must get these resources because they are common. But the government has put its feet down and together with the scientific community, we've been able to rehabilitate these ecosystems in order to bring them back to utility and ensure that at least we bequeath our future generation a more robust and sustainable environment. Um, the other thing is to enhance public health and food security and nutrition. The government of the day has also uh, come up with the, um, uh, we have a vision 2030 that is meant to ensure that Kenya becomes a middle level income country in the year 2030. But then, because of speed, in order to get speed, the government has come up with four major uh, areas of focus in the near term before 2022. Uh, one area being uh, food security and safety, and the government is very keen and putting in a lot of money there. Policies are being developed towards that election to ensure that food security is ensured while ensuring the production system, the processing systems are not wasteful, the productive system don't destroy the environment, and everything is done with a view of uh, bringing environmental concerns as well as social concerns on board in terms of development. Uh, this also has also found a second uh, point. The government is also coming up with a universal health care program, which also is part of the government um, uh, agenda at the moment. It's being implemented. Policies have been brought on board that ensure that uh, uh, healthy environmental conditions are ensured in everywhere, in every conditions, because most of our healthy problems, of course, are environmental associated in terms of water pollution, air pollution, uh, congested areas in slums and all that. And the government is trying to ensure these uh, um, um, problems that have ravaged our economy uh, and our environment before are addressed adequately. Of course, the production of crops that are tolerant to droughts in order to ensure that the climate change we face the, the changes that we are facing today, at least people are able to adopt to changing conditions and ensure they are able to produce adequate food even though the conditions have become harsher. So research as a um, lot in terms of bioeconomy, we have, uh, uh, the government has decided to fund research in universities um, using the National Research Fund to come up with the new tolerable uh, crops that can tolerate droughts, pests, and poor soils, so that, of course, they're able to produce sufficient food for supply unto the people, even though, um, of course, climate change is taking place. So adaptation strategies are uh, being put in place, and the government of the day is very much in the forefront in funding research in that direction, not only research, but also projects for implementation of uh, research, uh, resor results from those findings. And then there are production of green chemicals and new bio-based materials for industrial use and local bio uh, refineries. Uh, we have now a new, also another pillar, the pillar number three, that is manufacturing, that the government is very keen to do about, and that's another uh, area where bioenergy, through various biomass production systems, is being encouraged by the government in place of, bio, uh, of, fuel, of fossil fuels. And this is catching up very quickly. So many people are getting into this, uh, into this venture to capture, or rather to, 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 to take advantage of the government offer to come up with crops 
aquaculture, forest and micro -ferm uh, um, fermentations, or other kind of production system that will feed into this production of biofuels. And of course, uh, again, make some income from that. Uh, there is improved value addition using modern agro-processing system uh, in for high quality food and feed in agro, um, in agro uh, industrial system. We take into consideration as Kenya that uh, much of the food wastage is produced. We have enough produce, but then there is a lot of wastage even after the crops have come from the field, either because of poor storage or because of poor management, poor uh, logistics of moving it from one place where it is plenty to where it is needed. And the government is, of course, coordinating high level uh, uh, kind of system to ensure that there's good flow and supply of food, good storage, and uh, of course ensuring that climatic changes that have taken place, then uh, new technologies for storage that take into consideration the climate change scenarios that would of course result into uh, poor storage and destruction of food because of afrotoxin uh, infestations, uh, they are being addressed uh, quickly. And then we have a uh, uh, um, lot of uh, uh, effort to convert bio waste to useful products, that is recycling of bio waste, producing fertilizers that we can also apply back into the, into the farms, and all these are uh, taking place in our country. Um, of course, we look forward to creating a greener economy, and uh, listen to the government uh, of Kenya already has had two conferences. One was on green economy, and the other one was on brew economy, and seeking how to tap onto bio uh, resources to energize our Kenyan economy for the future. Um, in this case, the government is very keen at addressing um, issues on food security, and I would want to uh, uh, look at the strategies involving farmers uh, uh, through value chain and agro-processing that relate in opportunities. Um, food security in, exists, as you know, by definition, when all people at all uh, exist, when all people um, and at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to meet their uh, dietary needs and food preferences uh, for an active and healthy life. This can be, of course, achieved through a variety of things, and Kenya has planned these seven items uh, uh, that we have concerted in uh, various conferences in our country so that people tend targeting certain particular deliverables to ensure that our people are fed well and uh, ensure that people don't go without food at any time. One is by creating an enabling agri-production environment for improved food production. This has become very important to Kenyans in that um, it has been recognized that improved food uh, supply, uh, supply chain, well-regulated labor supply, appropriate storage to avoid waste is necessary. It's very important to ensure every stage of the chain from the supply of products to the uh, other uh, input to the farmers and ensuring they are there in good timing and ensuring that they are in uh, the good quality is being done through our various national institutions that check and inspect quality is provided to ensure there is no toxic materials that are introduced into agricultural system is being done. Then, of course, the labor relationships and uh, laws are being enhanced to ensure there is good productivity taking place. The next thing has been connecting farmers to market through well-managed agro agricultural value chains for different clubs. Um, I have been involved so closely, and when we met with the uh, Clement, uh, he was coming to study one of my pet project in the value chain development for cultural production and export to Europe. Uh, there are different types of value chains that the government is very keen to improve these value chain uh, developments and every stage, every participant, all the stakeholders are being taken care of and supported in order to ensure they do the appropriate um, development in space. Improving um, the agro and biomass pro processing sector um, I think I need to move faster. I'm 
fa faster. And then the agro sector also, uh, also produces large amount of waste, and uh, therefore, uh, which is severe to environmental problems. And so the bioeconomy of Kenya seeks to redress this by recycling these materials, and uh, many um, uh, materials are being rather. Uh, 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 many the youths are being funded. The government has come up with a youth fund to facilitate youth uh, participation in recycling this in order to create new, um, um, what can I call them, cottage industries for recycling and reproducing these things. And so we have come up with projects. I like what I've seen. Uh, um, keeping Namibia clean. We are also doing exactly that, uh, keeping Kenya clean. Uh, there are no smoking places in Kenya. There are places you will not. And uh, these kind of activities are being done. Uh, transforming Kenyan agro uh, processing sector so that it effectively adds value to the primary production um, is, is also another effort that we're doing. In the past, our products will be sold to Europe raw as they are, but now we are seeking to add value within the country in order to get more uh, income out of that. And then also ensuring higher capacity in all respect is created uh, for dynamic uh, parts. Okay, um, this is uh, the model that we uh, are using when I observe the Kenyan context and what we are doing now. I have adopted this from uh, the book. Um, adopted from OECD 2009, the bioeconomy to 2030. Um, yeah, you, 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 you can see the, 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 the locality and all this and all that. And because of time, we may not be able. So both from uh, the primary production that is of crops that is within agroecosystem and also from uh, uh, world all other biodiversity in the natural ecosystems, all these we try to manage and ensure that at least they feed, uh, they feed to the industrial growth in this case, but at the same time taking care of environmental concerns. So there's a lot of biodiversity conservation that is taking place in Kenya, and we see that finally the environment and the people will be healthy, they will be well fed, and all that. Um, the context, the, the contextual future for bioeconomy has highly complex system uh, that, oops, uh, that involves multiplicity of uh, technologies that work within various chains. That is uh, one area that is very crucial for us. And I want to believe that if you capitalize on the various value chain sections and ensure that every, uh, in every area the aspects of sustainable development are being observed, then we can go a long way. Approaches used are many, depending on what works. Uh, and so there is lots of research that's going on, action research by the people and doing research with the people as they do their products, uh, their production system, their Manf uh, manufacturing and processing systems, then we come up with the best, which then is recommended for use in the future. The real prayers at different stages of the supply and various chains are also being integrated so that people uh, uh, plants are being done from a consultative point of view. Uh, our constitution, 2010, demands that we don't do anything else without consulting the stakeholders. So stakeholder involvement in all that we do is becoming a major strategy. And if I can summarize, you can see uh, all these, uh, these are the roles of different but integrated uh, sectors of bioeconomy. Uh, you can see um, from there, there is a science and technology uh, that is in terms of innovations. This, there's a lot of research being done there and new innovations on how to do uh, different things is coming up. Then there is an issue of priority setting. Uh, and then there is a human capital development that is training so that there is capacity being built. And then we have implementation of innovative strategies for ensuring that at least the, the people are producing while not degrading the environment. And then there is better income generation, there is more wealth creation. And then funding, of course, is being facilitated by the government and also by donor agencies that many of them have capitalized on and we are able to move faster. Um, you can see we, we have three um, sections. We can say there is governance. Uh, there are three pillars of bioeconomy, according to my observations. I agree, put them in that. Uh, that it, uh, so 
Yeah. Uh, the first one there is governance and strategic oversight. There is need to be good uh, oversight by government, and so the government of the day at all its levels up to the grassroots need to be involved, and this needs to be involve uh, the all stakeholders of uh, the development process, so that it's not the government saying, but government should be able to uh, uh, in, um, consultatively be able to make policies, so that our policies in Kenya now, uh, policy development and advocacy are being done from a very consultative point of view, which is also demanded by the Constitution of Kenya. The second pillar, of course, is implementation and operation, because we can have very good policies, but still bad things are taking place, all negligent and uh, um, uh, things are taking place. So there is implementation and operation, and in this case we have implementing agencies, we have uh, research councils, uh, higher education institutions and TBOs, community-based creation, and all these are getting involved in different ways. Uh, you find that, for example, when we come to talk about resource, natural resource uh, utilization like water, in Kenya we have come up with a very good water uh, resource management policy where we have different bodies that have different respective responsibilities. But at the local level, I like it that we have come up with a scenario where we, the local communities are involved in managing of catchment areas so that nobody has a right to exploit more water than the other, neither degraded. So they police one another and uh, these rules, they are called rules, they have become very integral and important ways of ensuring the water resources are not degraded, they are protected, and even rehabilitation is being done. It's one thing that I would want to um, uh, encourage it can be done even here in Namibia, so that people don't just go and cut trees and just say, it's my tree. Yes, it's your tree, but the environment is ours. Yeah, They are our resources. We have a future to come. When you finish one tree, one tree that was there, you get maybe $100. Then you need to think about the Tree, the, the birds that were at home there, the carbon sequestration that was taking place, which was an ecological service to all of us. So there are many things to think about before somebody can be allowed even to cut a tree these days. In Kenya, you don't just cut a tree. The local community is concerned. It is your tree, but the oxygen it produces is ours. The carbon dioxide it absorbs, it saves us. So we have to to charge one another to ensure we take care of each other. So this kind of um, corporate responsibility needs to be developed with amongst the people so that implementation of participation of all policies is uh, at least adequate to support sustainable development. And thirdly, the industrialization, of course, we have to proceed with industrialization and economic development because at least we have to move on. Yeah, that is the third uh, pillar. Uh, quickly. Uh, this is how I have been, uh, when I look into the Kenyan sector, as far as we are, I just sampled a few um, value chains. We, 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 we could think of the agricultural value chain uh, as a concept, whatever agricultural activity you want to think about. Then you think about uh, the production process involved in agriculture, then the processing of uh, uh, biomaterials, manufacturing, and then the storage of these materials to avoid waste. And finally, we can talk of developments that come place in terms of technology and all that, and these are the benefits out there. You can take pastoralism, is also another livelihood, uh, which of course then it has its own production system. And so all that you, uh, is a combination of how various livelihood systems are uh, are interwoven in the Kenyan context so that food security is being ensured while at the same time concerns of, bio, uh, of sustainable develop, development and accept, acceptability of what's taking place socially is being ensured so that we have what we can call sustainable development. Uh, to come to almost an end, I have just uh, pointed out just uh, an example uh, of, uh, of, of Kenya's efforts and experience in agricultural labor, for example. I wouldn't take long there because uh, time is gone. But you can see efforts to create food security. Uh, the government of Kenya has focused on food security as a government, as a, as a government of priority area. Uh, this hunts, uh, of course, follows uh, the strategic projects that have been initiated, for example, crop livestock improvement, both for biotic and physical stresses associated in climate change. 
We have agro-processing initiatives that are being initiated in the country. An integrated food nutrition research program has been developed within our country and different institutions are involved. And the funding is being provided by the government through the National Research Fund, where we compete for funds for the best proposal. And then we have animal vaccine capabilities that are being developed in our national research facilities. Energy crop initiatives for biofuels are also being developed, and farmers are getting involved in producing these crops for cash crop, uh, ash cash crops. Then we have uh, biocontrol and biofertilizers. Um, aquaculture is also becoming a major, a major thrust. And uh, the current president actually introduced aquaculture as an economic stimulus when he was a minister of finance. And now that he's the head of state, he has uh, preached this message so that our university, Karatina University, uh, actually has been um, selected for uh, uh, use for community extension programs for aquaculture development in the country where people come from far to learn how to produce fish within their ecological uh, leather, um, uh, the, the convenience of their home side and all that. Um, uh, I would want to see, then the other example is an example of Kenya's efforts and experience in health. Uh, there are a lot of things that are going on now. Uh, new improved um, therapeutics and drug delivery systems are being developed within the country. There are new vaccine and other bio, uh, biologicals that are bio-safe uh, scenarios. There are new improved diagnostics that are being developed within the country. And all these things are being funded and in, uh, propagated by the government of Kenya, which I could say um, as a Kenyan, although I'm not a government agent or a politician, I would say kudos to our government. They are doing a good job. Um, in conclusion, bioeconomy um, project leadership uh, in any part of the world, I would summarize, needs to do the same. Um, in conclusion, it needs to ensure that, uh, yes, uh, it coordinates stakeholder involvement and role players in bioeconomy to ensure that it's being practiced and uh, the, um, uh, people are getting involved appropriately. Develop and implement strategic innovo uh, in innovation competencies. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, of urgent requisition or other requirement that people need to actually be trained competencies that will guide people in that direction um, need to be developed because people can only do what they know and what they are able to. Uh, develop full value chain from concept to product, uh, as we have already seen in the, on the, the outro there. Provide training in liquid side uh, informatics, functional genetics, uh, structural biology, synthetic biology, and the systemic uh, system biology. This will go a long way to facilitate uh, bioeconomy. Create and facilitate technology service platforms uh, where people who are not able to uh, access certain equipment can at least have one center of excellence in almost every city or institution to be able to do uh, good research. Uh, develop a pilot scale infrastructure for facilitated research in bio, uh, bio, bioprocessing. And then develop bioeconomy business uh, incubation facilities for facilitating agribusiness startups, um, which may result in development of biotechnology parks uh, within the country, uh, like here in Namibia. We're trying to do that. I am handing one of these major projects in Kenya. Uh, in my university, we're calling it Entrepreneurial University Project. And we are trying to revise our curriculum to ensure that whatever we are teaching our students, we don't teach them just to become job seekers, but we teach them to be job creators. And they have to, uh, this is the mindset we want to develop. So that they start thinking about business ideas that have a sustainability concept and connotation within them. Provide for, uh, for all such for required finances to enable project takeoff in a sustainable manner. And the government is doing that much in our country. Facilitate development of human capital, development including entrepreneurial skills. This is very important. And set up appropriate in instruments for addressing specific knowledge needs, such as biosafety in our development agenda, and establish a working knowledge management database, uh, all develop a bio portal, which could be available to everybody so that there's data available for people who want to do research and they can see what to do in the future. He, and, and therefore, there should be 
not issued. Uh, the um, uh, leadership, rather, the, the project leadership should develop strategic innovation programs to address strategic gaps and opportunities for the country. It's very necessary that research be conducted to ensure that we know, we ask ourselves, where are we? Yeah, where are we in terms of bioeconomy in this country? Where are we? Where have we come from? How did we get here? And where do we want to get to as a country? And how do we get there? And finally, who do we get there with? Those are questions that we can get to ask ourselves. And in the leadership, either government leadership, project leadership, whoever is involved in any country should be able to ask himself those questions and we can find ourselves getting to the right uh, direction, getting our feet right, and getting to achieve correctly the deliverables that we desire. Thank you so much. I don't think we should have let it, um, an academic take the stage first. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for such a short presentation. <laughs> uh, but I think it's important, you know, the, the, the challenge usually when you direct a ceremony of this nature is it, at, at which stage do you, do you say, okay, Professor, we've had enough? Uh, because we, the, the issues that, that are brought up are so important and are so wide-reaching and overarching that we just have to make time uh, to listen to some of these positions, especially um, when it comes to a case study of this nature. As you are aware, that has affected our time, so we are going to go ahead and give you the tea break, but we're only going to limit the tea break to 10 minutes, and we expect to continue at 11 o'clock sharp. Uh, just a reminder to all my presenters, if you have any presentation, please do make sure to take it to the technical guys at the back. And going forward, let's please try to time the presentations so we can make sure we cover everything for today. Thank you.
must move closer. Just to me. Then, uh, Uh, today is all about sustainable use of natural resources yes. and the bioeconomy. Can you just introduce yourself to, you, to our viewers and tell us where you're from? Uh, my name is uh, Tangeni Cornelius Kakweno Iambo. I am an NP uh, representing the oldest party in the country, Swanu of Namibia. I, we were invited, all parliamentarians were invited to this conference. And I find it to be of great importance because we, the latecomers on earth, human beings, and I'm saying latecomers in the sense that there were other animals that lived on earth, yes. but as soon as we came on earth, we started destroying our biodiversity. That's correct, yes. And uh, that is actually terrible, and it, uh, the toll is uh, it's coming. It, it, we will have to pay back one way or another. Because what we destroyed, will, nature will retaliate against us and we are about to experience some real uh, devastating consequences of the climate change. Obviously you, you, took a lot, you took time and you, took, and you made the effort to be here. What, are you, what have you learned so far this morning and what do you hope to take away from the conference at the Safari Hotel? I think from the few presenters that presented so far, I have learned that uh, it is important for us human beings to start thinking about new resources, new ways of uh, producing crops or even planting crops, because the old crops that we used to, to, to do are now almost obsolete and they, are, they, or they lost value. A carrot today is different from a carrot in the 1950s, for example. And so it is important for us to change with the times yeah. because things are changing and if we don't um, uh, comply to that, we are bound to, 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 as I said, extinction. Yes. We have an election coming up. Yes. <laughs> in November. What kind of role is uh, you know, climate change, sustainable use of resources and of course the bioeconomy going to play in your election campaign? Uh, quite a very important role because uh, I don't know whether you know my party background, but uh, I, I the have, party I that I lead is very well known for uh, encouraging people to be educated. We feel very much that an educated uh, nation or an educated world is a sustainable nation or self-reliant nation. And the more we are educated, all of us in the world, the more sustainable we, we will live or at least uh, uh, try to uh, cope with the new innovations and, uh, and, and changes. That's right. Especially climate change and so on. We all... So we need to educate even our poor, rest of the poor, farmers or villagers need a kind of enlightenment in order for us to live in a globe that we understand and try to plow back into it. Obviously, we know that the country is going through a very, very difficult time. Um, from your party side, what are you getting from the ground in terms of farmers and so forth and their battles? Yeah, well, it's, it's very devastating. The, the farmers especially are more affected than the urban dwellers because they depend primarily on, uh, on the climate uh, to to sustain their animals and their crops and so on. So they are very much affected and it would be good if uh, government could push uh, more efforts into uh, assisting yes. the, the farmers. I know that the government has done something by declaring state of emergency, but that's not enough. We need to practically go out there and assist these farmers practically yes. for them to sustain their crops and their uh, livestock. Th thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it and uh, good luck for the rest of the conference. You caught me on uh, unawares, but no. I, I hope I have done the justice. You did, to you did well. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, we've, we've, got another, we've got another guest. Come, please, please join me. How are you? Fine. Good. Uh, very interesting conference yes. so far. I just wanted you to introduce yourself to the viewers and then uh, tell them where you're from and who you're representing. 
I'm representing the European Union, that is the delegation of the EU in Namibia, and uh, I'm the head of cooperation overseeing our cooperation program with Namibia. Yeah. And your name? My name is Achim Schaffert. Pleased to meet you. Thank you, you. You spoke about it's been a very interesting morning, hasn't it? Absolutely, so far? Yeah. yeah. And uh, this is also something which we very much support. It's a very commendable initiative, and uh, the European Union, of course. Uh, stands ready to support, to continue supporting Namibia uh, in managing its natural resources. And when I say the European Union, I also uh, mean uh, the member states of the European Union and the European Commission. Yeah. I know we couch it sometimes in very, in very delicate terms, like sustainable development and resource management, but this is actually about the future of Earth, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing more important in uh, Namibia relies on a, on, on a good use of its natural resources for many reasons, uh, as most every country, every, every country does. And um, we uh, are happy to provide whatever expertise we, ca we possibly can and uh, to, to, to have this dialogue with our partners in Namibia. Thank you so much for the role the EU plays, especially in our country. And thank you for, for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, up next, we have uh, some international flavor, I believe. Some more international flavor. Good morning. How are you, sir? Fine, thanks. Can you just introduce yourself and tell the viewers where you're from? Uh, Spain. I, I live in the region of Murcia. It's a small region in the south of Spain. And, well, uh, the, the weather is similar to, to uh, a, a, a little similar to, to Namibia. Dry, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so you're feeling right at home? And we have, eh? Sorry? You're feeling right at home, you say? Yes, yes. And our agriculture is a, is a, a case of successful case. Uh, in Europe, uh, we are very important uh, producing uh, all the all kind of uh, vegetable and fruits. So we export to all, all the Europe and even abroad the, in another in another continent. So uh, I think it's a good example to to expose here in the conference. Uh, we try, of course, to. Uh, balance the natural natural uh, research with this agriculture intensive agriculture is very difficult but we try and of course it's been a very interesting morning so far what are your impressions so far from some of the speakers oh well uh, at the moment i i think is uh, the conference is very uh, 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 the equilibrium is very good uh, we we uh, take a different subject uh, but it's relation all all these uh, topics and uh, the speaker uh, at the moment uh, is, is very good. So I, I hope in my case I, I can apport some uh, piece of information, interesting information about you, for you. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really fun talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Up next, we have... Uh... Is the of Spain. His Excellency, how, how are you? How are you doing? Are you? I'm fine. Just for the, the interest of the viewers, please introduce yourself and uh, give us your designation. I know you're the ambassador, but just for the viewers. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Javier uh, Romera. I am the ambassador of Spain uh, to Namibia, and I've been here for a year already. Oh, fantastic. And what has been your impression so far of our beautiful country? Fantastic. As you say, it's a beautiful country. And I've traveled all throughout uh, Namibia, up to the north, close to Ruakana, close to the border with Angola, and to the very south, to Marienthal, and also to Luderitz, and to, of course to Walfish Bay, Swakomund, and to the main cities, Oshakati, uh, Ohandia, and so on. I, I'm really impressed. Yeah, you know, obviously, you know by now that we are a very dry country. Uh, that's why this conference is such, of such critical importance for us. Um, in terms of Spain, um, are, you, are you guys going to be bringing any best practices from uh, your experience in terms of sustainable development to this conference? Exactly, that's, that's, the, idea. that's the idea. We have in Spain a, a big variety of uh, climate diversity. We have the north, which is more humid, with more uh, rainfall. Then we have the south and the southeast, particularly uh, some regions of, uh, of the east, that's Murcia, Almeria, where we have a very dry climate and in fact some similarities can be drawn uh, between the arid climate of the bush in Namibia and those regions in Spain. And indeed we are doing a lot in terms of uh, finding innovative and creative solutions uh, with water. 
His Excellency, can you tell me a bit more about our bilateral relations? What other kind of industries and sectors are we cooperating in? Thank you. I would say that the main areas of our collaboration are in three domains. One, the most obvious one perhaps, is fisheries, where Spain and Spanish companies with local partners have been very present uh, for the last uh, 50 years, I, I dare say. Then we have another sector, which is a more recent one, which is in agriculture. Indeed, we have in the north, we have asparagus uh, cultivation. We are already starting to process some of the asparagus that have grown there in, o in Oshifo. Where, and we are employing at around, uh, next year we will be employing at around 600 uh, jobs. We will be offering through this asparagus uh, project in uh, close to Ruacana. And then the third area is uh, renewable energy. We have already two solar energy uh, investments, one in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, from Alten uh, Company in Mariental, 37 uh, megawatts, and another one in Rospina, uh, AEE, that's the, the company, is a smaller one, it's five megawatts, uh, that are uh, directly, they go directly to the net, to NumPower. And uh, in terms of uh, what we can offer in terms of business opportunities, what else do you think that uh, Spain would be interested in investing in Namibia at this stage? I think that there is a still a lot to do in agriculture. I think there is room and a huge margin to put a lot of land uh, which, let us say, is idle at the moment, to put it to production and to uh, learn from each other and to to contribute to the food security in uh, Namibia, which I think is one of the is of the essence when it comes to the development of any country, but also of Namibia, of course. In terms of your tenure as as ambassador, what are kind of your focus areas in terms of improving the relations between the two countries? I'm interested, aside of these economic areas I've, I've just mentioned but also in the cultural area. I am I'm trying to improve uh, the access of the la Spanish language of, uh, for the Namibian people of how to get access to learn the language because there are not many opportunities that is so true. Uh, to learn the language. And it's a beautiful language, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much. You're very kind. But it's a useful language as well. Yes, that's it, correct. It, it, that's it opens correct. you the whole world of, uh, of uh, South America, from Mexico to the Patagonia. Absolutely. And, uh, and you're just in front of them. You're, you're very close in terms uh, in trade terms and in many terms, I and mean, you're not that far away from the from the continent in uh, in South America. It's just a matter of opening at least the cultural space and looking forward across the ocean. Ambassador, I wish you the best for your tenure forward. How long are you still with us? At least two more years, I hope. Excellent, excellent. And uh, I'm sure by the time you go back, you would have. Uh, become an ambassador for us in Spain. <laughs> Isn't that so? Count on that. <laughs> Excellent. Count on, count thank, on you so, thank you so much for your time. It was really great speaking to you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for your uh, uh, kindness. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And here we have a lovely lady. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Thank I'm great. For our viewers, introduce yourself and tell us where you come from. Okay, uh, my name is Sarah. Yes. Uh, Nitenge. I come from the Namibia Statistics Agency. Yes. yes Very important agency. Very important, yeah. did you say? Yeah. Yes. And 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 uh, the NSA's interest here today. Um, what are you guys hoping to get from the conference? Okay. Um, personally, for myself, I I am a focal point for establishment of environment statistics in the country. So from the conference, I really uh, look forward to networking with other um, stakeholders in the yes. field, and also just um, finding solutions to our. Um, Current challenges. Yeah. You, you know, we have drought. We have um, absolutely yeah. our forests yes. are degrading, and we have um, all these pressing issues that we need to address. So I really just look forward to um, hearing from the speakers, learning from others, and also sharing um, my little knowledge that I have. Thank you so much, and, and and thank you to the NSA because yeah, they do an amazing job. They really do. Oh, thank you very thank much. You. Can you and kindly uh, please take a seat so that we can we start kind of uh, with the and all these first session? Without data. So data is really important. Can I also to call on and to yes. make um, informed decisions? Of course, the panelists of course. for Thank the so panel for discussion me. to please make their right. way to the technical area on your way. immediate left side to get Excellent. your microphones. Uh, Dr. Uh, Miguel, just for the viewers, Angel Fernandez, Carrillo, uh, uh, 
Mulima Mushikobanji, yes, Ruli Fenter, much. and uh, Professor uh, Dr. Oliver Ruppel. Please uh, go to the technical side so you can get uh, your microphones fixed for the panel discussion. Oh, that's on that end. So almost three years I'm here. I enjoy the climate. Ms. Kambinda, you may also join them so that you can also get Always a better day than yesterday. Yes. That's very important. Yes, that's it? my agenda. Yes. No, it should be everybody's <laughs> agenda, shouldn't it? Definitely. <laughs> and today I made it. <laughs> yes. yes. So you're having a better day than yesterday, you say? Absolutely. Excellent. But you know, I afraid tomorrow what I have to do because it has to be better than today. <laughs> yeah, let's stay positive. So, absolutely. So it, it keeps me going up. Yes. And, and the conference, very, very important issues, sustainable resource management, bioeconomy, these are things that affect all of us throughout the whole world. Absolutely, that is online challenges in my opinion. So we have to pay on daily base attention and bring it to the notice of the public because uh, it is a teamwork. That's correct. Yes. In terms of Iran's if presence... In the meantime, I can... Yeah, I see it's, it's there. Um, All right, I would like to observe all the protocol. <coughs> I think that has been done this morning already, and I see there are still people coming in. If I could ask everyone to take their seats. And I'd like to formally welcome you to this session on the current state of agriculture and climate. and looking at smart ways towards food security. So we have less time than what is on the program. We did start late, and therefore we'll try and save time wherever we can. There are basically two parts to this session. The first part will be some formal presentations or interventions or speeches, and we do have I understand on behalf of the Minister of Agriculture, we have uh, Madam Kambinda, so she will deliver that uh, speech. I hope I have it right. Uh, and then, of course, we will have a presentation by Dr. Miguel Carrillo. He has already been introduced. The profiles of the speakers are also in the files that have been handed over to you, so in the interest of time, I would not really go through their profiles. Uh, and then after that, uh, we will have a moderated panel discussion. So I'll try and give uh, each of the three panelists who have not spoken before about five minutes just to share some thoughts on the theme of this session. And if there's anything to add from the two other panelists who have spoken or would have spoken already, they can also do that very briefly. And I'll have one or two questions to kickstart the conversation, and then I'll open it up uh, for questions and comments uh, from uh, the floor, uh, which I think is really the idea of the interaction between the panelists and the floor. Uh, but before we then get to, to, to the first uh, speaker, I'd like to basically just set the scene. Uh, and in setting the scene, I have a couple of slides I'll be sharing some facts with you, but I'll also be posing questions, questions which I will not answer, but hopefully in the panel discussion, if any of the panelists want to answer to some of those questions, they are free to do that. Otherwise, I pose them really to try and get started on some thinking, as well as some reflection uh, on our part as, as Namibians. Um, let me then uh, move on. I think if, if, we, if we look at this whole thing, we need to look at what's in the scene that we are actually looking at. What does the scene look like? I think what we see is that we have an economy that is in severe recession, and I think that's really the context in which all our discussions need to happen. It's an economy that, to my mind, requires rebooting from the various 
elements of that economy or from the various sectors, it appears to require structural reform. And I've got a slide later that probably backs up um, that statement that I make. I think it is much more in need of structural reform than simply hoping it will sort itself out. And agriculture could really be a significant contributor to growth uh, in this economy. I think that's the first thing around the economy on the scene that we are talking about. The second important thing is really the fact that drought has become a permanent condition of our landscape, and I think we better get used to that. And our plans must take into account the fact that drought is always going to be with us. And not hope that you know every time there's a better season and then there isn't and so on. But I think we must plan in such a way that the way that we use our resources takes into account that drought is a permanent condition. And I'll share a slide on that as well. What we also see on the scene is that agriculture's contribution to gross domestic product or agriculture's contribution as a percentage of gross domestic product is in long-term decline, and I'll try and demonstrate that to you with a slide as well. And then the other reality on the scene is that agriculture's long-term contribution to employment is also on the decline. But I think interestingly, if I look at funding of agriculture, that has been on the up all the time. So there are critical questions that we've got to ask ourselves as we actually tackle um, this reality. So I think what you see there, and <clears throat> now I understand what, what Prof was uh, referring to, uh, but what you see uh, on this slide is actually the long-term decline. This is really depicting your quarter-on-quarter quarter, uh, development uh, in, in the economy. But what you can see, uh, since the third quarter of 2013, you can really see, if you do a trend line, that long-term decline. I think that's the first thing that you will see. And of course, more recently, you would see that we are either in negative or zero territory in terms of quarter-on-quarter quarter growth. And that is prolonged. Um, if you even take it back and look at the time when we had the global financial crisis, I think at most we had three quarters of consecutive negative growth. But what you see recently is much more than that. And that's why I ask the question, is this perhaps unique to Namibia? Can we always say this is because of external factors? Or is this structural that we actually need to try and, and, and deal with uh, as, a, as a country? So if I can then move on. Um, I think this slide really talks to, to the weather, to the climate, to rain. And what you will see here is I've done the long-term average um, rainfall. So is that solid line there. And if you really look at the last 30 years, this is really what this uh, graph says, half of those years, 15, the rainfall is actually below, you see, your, the, the long-term average. And nine out of those 15 years, we had formally declared drought. All right? So we better used, get used to the condition that drought is actually a permanent condition, and the way that we manage it must then be in line with that. So I think that is really just looking at the scene, looking at it from the point of view of, of, of rainfall. This uh, slide talks to agriculture's contribution to GDP over time. So I think what you see is that contribution is actually on decline over time. So that's really what that linear line says. But you know, even if you look at the actual trends, that is really what it is. Much more from higher levels um, you know, 7-8% um, around independence. Uh, and I think if you extended this, you're probably talking 3 or below 3 um, currently going into the future. So that is really uh, what, what it says. Now, of course, if you look at the absolute uh, value, um, you know, of that, uh, if you take current prices, you know, that is going up. But my question is, is it because of production? Is it because of pricing or prices that have been going up? And I think that's really what it is. It's, it's, it's prices that are driving that, that thing up. Do we fully understand the underlying causes of that decline in the contribution of agriculture to GDP over time? It's a question that I'm posing, and uh, I'm not answering it at this uh, stage. So if I can uh, move on, the important thing is also to look at the contribution of 
agriculture to employment and the next two slides I'll take together. I think there's one or two cleanups that I will still do, but I think the story is quite simple. So if you look over time, the contribution of agriculture to employment has also been declining. Um, although, of course, you know, if you look at the next slide, you will see that agriculture still remains the biggest single contributor to employment uh, in, in the economy, but it's actually uh, on the decline. Um, and again, I ask the question, do we fully understand the underlying causes of what's happening in agriculture, and how can we tackle that in a smart way that we actually can then uh, reverse um, this trend? Um, so I think that is what you see there, and, and here you simply see, so although it's on the decline, it is still the single uh, biggest contributor to employment uh, in, in the country. Uh, and therefore it requires policy support, it requires all smart interventions so that we can actually um, maintain it as core um, in, in, in the economy. Um, so this uh, basically looks at funding. So what we've done here is we've taken agribanks funding over time, we've taken the agri funding of commercial banks over time. So what you see obviously is if you take the period from 2010 to 2018, um, and this is consider it cumulative credit or outstanding loans or total loan book, you actually see a doubling uh, in funding. Um, you now from just around three million to uh, just over seven, seven, sorry, three billion to just over seven billion. So funding has been going up. Admittedly, a lot of that is obviously to, to go into um, farmland, which has become expensive specifically if you look at the period from 2010. But if we get that farmland, are we using it productively if what we are seeing is the contribution is actually coming down over time um, and so on. Um, so that's just another um, one that I'd like to look at. So let me leave you with key questions. One is, so how do we de-risk the country from perennial droughts? Surely we cannot just watch it and, and hope that some or other time there will be rain. So there must be actions that we can begin to take so that we de-risk the country. Whether rain comes or doesn't come, at least we are able to actually carry on. That's one. And how do we diversify at farm level? So that's at the level of the individual farmer. And how do we facilitate that diversification um, you know, as a, as a country, because surely the farmers can do something, but how do we catalyze that as a country is a question I'd like to ask. And then, of course, uh, we can talk about use of natural resources and smart and so on, but we need to be inclusive, and inclusivity requires us also to have on board, especially your communal farmers, and I think the big question is always around the northern communal farmers, so how do we provide access to those farmers to markets um, so that if they embark upon smart ways of agriculture and sustainable use of natural resources, they can actually benefit from it and there's an incentive for them to do that. And then the other thing is, of course, how do we actually cover the infrastructure gaps in communal areas so that we can facilitate or encourage farmers to produce as long as you have gaps in terms of water infrastructure, in terms of transport infrastructure, roads and so on, in terms of telecoms, which is really driving your mobile uh, technology, um, you can talk about smart ways of agriculture, but if you don't have the basics in place, you may as well f actually forget about that. It's the submission that I'm making. And how do we expand farming skills levels on a national um, scale? to improve productivity and increase output. Because I think land is one thing, all the other ingredients are, whether it's finance or water or transport or other, but we also need to look at skills. Um, so how do we actually ensure that we expand farming skills so that we can bring about increased production? And overall, how do we create climate resilience uh, through climate smart agriculture? So those are the questions I'd like to leave. And if any one of the panelists would like to respond to them later, you're quite welcome. I am looking at uh, the chairs here. I'm sure they will come a bit later. But I think for now, I'd like to stop here with my setting the scene. I'd like to invite the keynote speaker.
My understanding is that it is Madam Kambinda who is standing in for the Honorable Minister of Agriculture. So whoever it is, can they please come forward and deliver the keynote speech. Good morning. I have been uh, introduced already, and uh, I just want to say that uh, before I get into the speech, I'm actually excited to be here uh, because of the nature of uh, these uh, conference uh, interventions which are going on since the beginning in the morning. I've been enjoying every presentation. Uh, being a person from agriculture production, extension and engineering services, the interventions at hand are actually our daily uh, uh, activities. Perhaps that forms one of the reasons why I and my colleague, uh, Mr. Joseph Hailwa, have been nominated to represent the minister this particular uh, uh, conference. Uh, I would like to tender the apology of the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Water and Forestry, together with the Executive Director, who are not able to be with us physically. But uh, believe you me, we briefed, and uh, yes, we'll try our level best. I would like to present uh, the speech as uh, indicated, though on the side, uh, the facilitator tried to whisper to me, can you not compress, you know, and uh, definitely I'm not allowed to compress the Honorable Minister's speech. You will definitely have to bear with me. I'm very, very sorry about this, but I'll try my best to, uh, to, to fast track the deliberation of the speech. So I read it as it is, and it's a keynote speech by Honorable Minister for, uh, uh, to this conference. Uh, the protocol has been established already, so in the interest of the time, director of ceremonies, I observe all the protocols. It is my privilege to have been afforded this opportunity to deliver a key note speech at this session, which will deliberate on agriculture in Namibia, the current state of agriculture climate smart ways towards rural development and food security. Ladies and gentlemen, director of ceremonies, climate change is recognized as one of the world's biggest development challenges in the 21st century that continues to pose serious threats to the environment and human life. Climate change is undermining efforts to achieve key development goals towards rural development, poverty reduction, and food security. In addition, it is one of the main impediments to the attainment of sustainable development goals. Ladies and gentlemen, director of ceremonies, to counteract the numerous risks associated with climate change, there are many ongoing initiatives at global, regional, and national levels. At global level, such initiatives include the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement, among its others. Namibia. Namibia is an active part to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which aims to strengthen global response to the threat of climate change. As a result, Namibia resolved to adopt 
and implement policies and measures designed to mitigate the adverse effects of climate change on the environment and to adapt to such change. Director of Ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, Namibia's vulnerability to climate change is evidenced by continued exposure to extreme weather-related events such as flooding and droughts, erratic rainfall patterns, as well as gradual temperature increases observed over time. Here, I would like to pause to say there are times when you've had droughts and also flash floods at the same time, a phenomenon which is very unique to Namibia. As a result, Namibia is classified as one of the countries at risk in terms of agriculture losses. For instance, since climate change is expected to impact agriculture yields, there is no doubt that it will impact negatively on the livelihoods and food security of farmers in particular and the Namibian citizenry in general. This means for sustained food security to be assured, climate resilient approaches and responsive, responsible agriculture investments should be made in order to improve productivity and increase yields. Yes, indeed, about 70% of our population depend directly or indirectly on agriculture in terms of food, income, and livelihoods. It is for this reason that at the national level, the agriculture sector has been singled out as one of the priority sectors which should be harnessed to bring about the much needed social economic development and improvement to the well-being of the majority of the Namibian people, taking into account the effects of climate change. It is for this reason, indeed, that Namibia is committed to climate smart agriculture approach. Ladies and gentlemen, Director of Ceremonies, in this regard, the Minister of Agriculture, Water and Forestry, with the assistance of development partners, introduced programs, namely one, Dryland Crop Production Program, or namely uh, DCPP, also uh, passionately referred to as Rain-Fed uh, Rain Program. Two, Comprehensive Conservation Agriculture Program, CCAP. Three, Climate Resilient Agriculture in the three of the vulnerable extreme northern communal, uh, northern crop growing regions, uh, abbreviated as CREV as well as the development of rangeland management policy and strategy with objectives of mitigating and, adopting and adapting to climate change to build the resilience of farmers and agroforesters. Ladies and gentlemen, Director of Ceremonies, these programs are responsive to the country's fifth national development plan, the national Climate Change Strategy and Action 2013-2020 and the Namibia Climate Smart Agriculture Program 2015 to 2025, which aims at improving agriculture output, creating a resilience in communal areas and enhancing food security at household and national level. Ladies and gentlemen, these interventions are in line with the 2014 Marabo Declaration on Accredited Accelerated Agriculture Growth and Transformation for Shared Prosperity and Improved Livelihoods. Through this declaration, Namibia, like all African countries, has a commitment to end, ending hunger by 2025. Director of Ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, the Dry Land Crop Production Program, or DCPP, is implemented in all the crop growing regions of the country, namely Zambezi, Kabango West, Kabango East, Omsati, 
Ohangwena, Oshana, Oshkoto, Kunene, Ochudonjupa, and Omaheke. Under this program, the government provides subsidized inputs, seed and fertilizer, and services such as plowing and weeding services to communal farmers. The Comprehensive Conservation Agriculture Program, on the other hand, is implemented in all the 14 regions in Namibia. The Minister of Agriculture, Water and Forestry is jointly implementing the CCAP, or Comprehensive Conservation Agriculture Program, in partnership with development partners, such as the GIZ, uh, Food Agriculture Organization, the program promotes conservation agriculture practices and good agriculture practices because the two are complementary and is aimed at creating resilience of farmers to varying climate conditions and at enhanced crop production and productivity. Director of Ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, with regard to the CREV project, which the ministry is implementing jointly with the Minister of Environment and Tourism and the Environment, the Environment Investment Fund of Namibia. The project aims at increasing the climate resilience and reducing the food insecurity of subsistence farmers in Namibia. The project is implemented in the vulnerable extreme northern crop growing regions of Zambezi, Kavango East, and Kavango West for a period of five years, ending in March 2022. In addition, the CREV project is designed to scale up the adoption of adaptive measures such as climate-smart agriculture, including conservation agriculture and micro-drip irrigation. This project is supporting the development of Mashare Agriculture Development Institute, also known as MADI, into a climate resilient agriculture center of excellence, which will carry out trials and demonstrations on climate smart agriculture. It is important. It is important to highlight that this project will make it possible for farmers to have access to off grid solar energy technologies, including water pumping for small scale micro horticulture systems and the refrigeration for harvested foods. Director of Ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, shifting from traditional agriculture practices or conventional agriculture practices to more climate smart agriculture approaches will not only help protect farmers from the adverse effects of climate change and offer a way to reduce greenhouse gas emission, but will also improve farm yields and household incomes, leading to stronger, more resilient communities. Therefore, we owe it to the 70% of our population that depend direct or indirect on agriculture in terms of food, income, and livelihoods to ensure that climate smart agriculture is promoted and practiced. In conclusion, I wish you a fruitful deliberation and uh, a successful conference. I thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Mildred Kambinda, for delivering the keynote speech on behalf of the minister. Certainly, you've given us insights into some of the interventions from the ministry's side, and you've made a, quite a strong policy statement that the ministry supports smart agriculture. Um, so we appreciate that. I think without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Miguel Carrillo, who will give us yet another example from Spain. Dr. Carrillo.
Can we welcome him with another round? He, he came from so far. Good morning, uh, uh, all assistants, uh, participants, authorities. I'm uh, happy to stay here in Namibia. It's my first time here in Africa. So I, en I enjoy your country. Uh, today, uh, I want to, first, I want to, to, to thank to the organization, uh, Clem Dr. Clemens, of course, and Especially, I want to thank uh, to my uh, ambassador of Spain here in Namibia, Mr. Uh, ja Antonio Javier Romera, and uh, their, their family that accept me for a day. So, thank you so much. Well, uh, I don't have much time, so I, I give some, only some piece of information, but your pres my presentation will you, will you have in the... Uh, in the next day, so I'm sure you can you can share this information or 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 uh, read slowly. Well, uh, for me it's important the script uh, to to description uh, uh, our re my region because uh, I think we have some common uh, characters. For example. It's a, a small region uh, in the south of uh, Europe, Spain is here, and the region of Murcia is a small region in the south of east of Spain, in the Mediterranean coast. We suffer a Mediterranean climate, so uh, we have extreme temperature, mainly hot temperature. For example, the, the average annual temperature is 19.5. But we reach in summer until uh, 40, 45 degrees. Okay. Uh, but the rainfall is a little. We reach the, the average uh, rainfall is 270 only. So uh, the total uh, hour of sun, uh, 3,126 hour. So we have a good condition to produce a lot of kind of crops, but the main problem is we, we, we have a lack of water. We don't have much water. Uh, and uh, all studies in our searches in the European Union said uh, in this area we are more exposed to uh, climate global change. This is uh, a, a, a new phenomenon. Uh, for example, this September, we suffer a very important uh, extreme flash food uh, after a, a long uh, drought. So we, we reach uh, even uh, three, 300 or more uh, liters per square meter. So it's uh, a much water in only two days, one day, or in an hour. So we suffer these consequences. The damage of this uh, phenomenon in two days only is approximately 800 million of euro in a small region. So the global climate change is very important. It's a reality. It's not illusion. It's not the, that some research said. This is the real situation in, in some uh, countries. This is, I don't have time, so you, you, you have all information. This is the maps of average annual temperature. It's a small region, but it's curious because we have, uh, sorry, we have uh, in, in, a, uh, in a little uh, distance, we have uh, much difference uh, in temperature, in rainfall, as we said, it's like a continent because we have in the north, it's a cold weather, we can uh, crop different uh, crops, uh, plantation, 
compared with the south. It's very different. So only in 100 kilometers. This is the average annual rainfall. Okay. Um, uh, that is, I say, I said before. We suffer a structural deficit water in our uh, main river, is Segura River. So uh, we we evaluate uh, this lack of water on uh, 460 uh, hectometers two years. It's very important this this uh, quantity of water. So we need uh, transfer water from other regions. But it's very difficult because other regions like this water. Uh, so we try to, to, to use in the best place this water, but it's very difficult to, to, agree, to agree with other people in different regions. This is the, ten, the trend of temperature in our coast is extreme, this chain. And for example, uh, in, in some uh, studies said that the coast of Spain and, of course, in Italy and Greek, Greek uh, we, have, uh, we are more exposed to global change. Okay. Uh, my region is an important region in, in Europe, uh, I mean about the agriculture, because we produce uh, a lot of different products, uh, 100 different or more different kind of products, different crops, plantation, and produce uh, a lot of uh, products that export mainly uh, in Europe, European Union, but now we try to, uh, to, to reach other, uh, other countries abroad uh, European Union. Uh, we have a lot of vegetables, mainly lecture, we produce 80% of lecture in, in Europe, uh, in some uh, fruit tree, for example, peach, lemon, uh, orange, etc. We have uh, grapefruit, grapefruit uh, uh, vineyard, etc. And we use a special uh, or technological system to, to increase our production. For example, irrigated land, we have uh, 130,000 uh, uh, hectares, more, more or less uh, 40 or 50 uh, percent of land in, in Murcia, uh, agricultural land, is but this, uh, by this uh, crop system. And we have uh, as well uh, Greenhouse is an important production, mainly tomatoes and paprika. This is the grain production. I pass this information. Our market, mainly uh, Germany, uh, United Kingdom, uh, uh, France, um, Netherlands. How important is agri-food? It's very important for us. So, uh, for example, the evolution of agri-food agri export is this graphic, and we reach uh, almost uh, 5,000 uh, uh, million of euro, only in my small region, so it's very important. For example, the GP, GDP in in, this year, in the last year, is uh, 1,350 million of euro. Is only the 4.3 4 uh, of regional total export, but it's very important uh, in employment. We reach directly 11.2, uh, but if you consider indirectly uh, employment, we we, this, this value is higher. For our different weather, uh, depend on the situation, we have a lot of, uh, of different kind of crops. 
in dr we have dry land crops, we have uh, irrigated oxide vegetable crops, we have irrigated greenhouse veg uh, vegetable crops. And okay. The nature important is other common characteristic with this uh, land. Uh, in my region, we have a higher uh, diversity, biodiversity, compared with other parts of the, of the Europe. For example, uh, we have the, the uh, 2,100 uh, 100 vascular plant species, only in my small region. We have a lot of uh, different natural areas uh, with sun regulation. It's the red natura in Europe. It's very important. This is the natural uh, red network uh, uh, natural areas for birds, for plants, etc. This is an example only in the last cave. It's beautiful, different to Namibia, of course. We have water, not much, but we have some. This is the Mar Menor Sea. It's a salty natural uh, lake. Uh, this is the Mediterranean coast, and this is a special ecosystem that we have problems with this for agriculture, for uh, tourists. So we need to compatibilize these activities with uh, this natural uh, zone. Some example, of course, is different to your, your wildlife. Your wildlife is very impressionant. This is small, but all animals uh, is very important in, in the earth, not only the big. Okay, okay. So in my region, we have a lot of endemism. Changing uh, challenges in the agriculture in the region of Murcia. In the past, I don't speak about this, but is more or less the similar in all, all the countries. But, uh, for example, in the present, of course, in the future, we have the past, but the main uh, challenges now is global climate change, I think so. We have to adaptation, because in this moment it's very difficult to apply prevention or mitigation now. So we have to adapt adapt to this phenomenon, to this uh, chain. Uh, internalization, industrialization, attending uh, the difficulties uh, in specific, on specific areas, for example, mountain or other limitation. There are a lot of, but for example, I highlight uh, by economy, we try to, igual, uh, the similar than in Kenya, uh, we try to uh, to um, Related all economic area, uh, uh, apply uh, new technologies and increase the relationship because you you can uh, reuse uh, products and products and the products. So this is our trend now. Some example of this response in water, for example, irrigation modernization. We invest a lot of money. In, in this technology, water dam, pressure, and located irrigation, we have the 80% of, of the land. Uh, distribution pipes, saving energy system, telecontrol, etc. Cont uh, control system of irrigation in farm, measuring uh, fertilization, uh, information and, com and communication technologies, irrigation optimization, we have a, net, uh, a special web that uh, farmers can, uh, can see the needs of water in their uh, farm. Uh, hydroponic crops. Uh, reuse of treated water is very important for us. We re, uh, reuse 19% uh, of the water from the cities. It's very important for us. The desalization uh, salty water. We try to, to do this, but it's very expensive, this method. Uh, catching of rainwater, uh, rainfall water, or, or suffocation, and catching uh, of drink uh, water. 
Sun samples and picture, I think, is the best. This is the, the, can, the canal that we transfer water uh, from other regions. It's a very important uh, infrastructure uh, in, for my region. This is an example of dam. We cover now with special uh, uh, material to reduce the, the needs of water. We have this technology in, in far. This is some plants of water purification of desalinization. It's very expensive, this technology and this infrastructure, of course. We have uh, in a, re a network in our region, uh, I don't remember, but maybe 50 or 70 points with agrochemic uh, station to get information of the uh, rainfall, the temperature, the humidity, and something like that. This is a system to control uh, by in, in the in the distance you can control the uh, when you open or close the irrigation the, the the farmer can use the mobile phone all all the irrigation is connected this is an example of sensor uh, in into the into the farm this is a real farm, and this is the technology by mobile phone to, to use and, and control. For example, the farmer can go here and control in the distance uh, the condition into the greenhouse, for example. Different kind of uh, crops, protected crops, not only vegetable. Uh, we use uh, in tree, in order to to get uh, early fruit, for example, or protect it from uh, the uh, climatic phenomenon. Environment is very important. We we have rules to control and reduce the the use of phyto phytosanitary products in Europe. In European Union, it's very important. This this subject. Uh, uh, we. We have a lot of uh, kind of a good agricultural practice and uh, even advanced production system, integrated or organic production. Now in my region, it's very important now, this, this kind of crops, uh, etc. Some picture, for example, uh, natural enemies in my, in my region is very uh, important and farmer get used to, you, to use this, this kind of uh, enemies and the strategy with these different plants and different pests in order to reduce the, the phytosanitaries. Birds uh, and stuff like that. For example, I, I try in, in my region to use uh, this, uh, the multifunctional uh, plant barrier. You, we plant specific plants to increase the variety and uh, to host other natural enemies. So it's very important and now we try to, to do this project. Uh, trituration of pruning and mulching to protect the soil because we have uh, rainfall very aggressive, so it's very important to protect the soil. The technology of monitoring traps, control traps, uh, etc. for the pest. This is my work, my real work in, in Murcia now is this. Hmm? Can I ask you to wrap up? Sorry? Can, can you finish? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, other example, but I pass, okay. This is the some example of quality. Uh, but this is important, I'm finished, uh, <laughs> sorry. This is um, more or less the main uh, tools that we use in the past and now to uh, improve our agriculture. We uh, improve our uh, agriculture all days, 
our farmer think how I can improve my, my crops, my plantation, my economical result, all days. It's very important to change the, the mind. So, I don't have time, but research, of course, innovation, development, training, but not only training in a in an university level. It's a necessary engineer, of course, <laughs> I, I hope, but it's very important the medium level, because the people that crop, that use this technology, is not uh, university people, it's uh, other kind of level. So this level is very important to begin to, to take a, a, a good agriculture and very competitive agriculture, not only engineer, but it's important, of course. Uh, cooperation of farmers is very important in my region because we have a lot of small farmers, so uh, this, farm, this farmer uh, joined in a big company and with, this, uh, with the, the goals to, uh, to, 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 to have more power in the market. This is an example. Our uh, institution of research and innovation uh, about we have some, uh, a lot of uh, uh, company, private company that invest as well. University, of course. Of course. This is an example. Uh, breeding, pl plant breeding, for example. We, we, we uh, investigate or uh, research to new products with uh, uh, best character to the market. For example, circular economy is an example in Spanish, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's not mine. It's a circular economy. Uh, with aquaculture, farmer, cut the, 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 the carbon dioxide and reuse in the greenhouse, reuse the water into the, uh, the, the, the ponds. So this is the way, I think so. Training, plant demonstration for the farmer to transfer this technology. Okay. We have different ways to, to reach this, uh, these tools. Of course, the financing, is, the, the funds is very important. The banks, the, the, the role of, of the banks is very important because a farmer needs uh, money to, to improve the, the field and the farmer. But also cooperation and uh, other, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the laws regulation is important as well for, for my government because we oriented the, the farmer. So that's all. I, I'm sorry for the, 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 the fast presentation, but thank you so much for the attention. I'm sorry. All right. Um, I just want to see if the, this thing works now. Can you put it on? They had uh, said, all right, thank you very much. I think we should give uh, Dr. Carrillo another round of applause. <laughs> and my apologies, I had to remind him. Uh, I think it's really, I know he has a lot to share, but time is also a challenge. But I have no doubt that there will be a lot of people who would want to engage you, doctor, uh, afterwards. May I now take this opportunity to invite the panelists who will join the two panelists that are already up here. I'd like to invite uh, Mwilima Musakavanji up front from uh, NNFU. Musho. I'd like to invite uh, Ruli Fenter from Namibia Agricultural Union. If you could please join us up front here. And I'd like to invite uh, Professor Oliver Ruppel from the University of Stellenbosch. If you could join us up here. Is there anybody who is here on behalf of Musho from NNFU? Right.
Right, thank you and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to have you um, on my panel. Um, maybe if I can just uh, start with the two new panelists. Uh, Ruli, what's your five minutes thoughts on the topic that we are actually discussing? Yes. <coughs> Thank you, thank you, uh, Sakaria. Um, I have a two two slides and a presentation. Maybe we can, if if we can show that quickly, if I'm allowed. It's the only two slides. Sure. Thank you. Just go ahead. <laughs> thank you, moderator. Um, I think uh, the most important message we want to bring across is that. In this difficult economic conditions we are in, um, we strongly believe from a farmer's point of view that primary, agri primary agriculture is one of the key, key, key issues and the key sectors which can start this economy. Um, but this growth in the economy will only start at farm level um, in, and only if that, if that farm level is profitable. If we destroy in our policies primary production, the whole total value chain is disintegrating and we're going nowhere. Um, and research has shown if one dollar in is invested in primary agriculture, three to four dollars are being generated, a million dollars are being generated in the total economy. If you're looking at that value chain which I've shown you, the six or seven percent of GDP which we're talking of, or four percent what it is, is only the primary sector in the primary production sector. But there's a whole value chain which, from, which these, uh, pr from, these, uh, from which the primary agricultural sector is feeding. So primary pr production is buying input, input to the, from the input suppliers. It is uh, marketing the, uh, the livestock through auctions. It is using transport to transport products. It is uh, selling their products to processing abattoirs, export and export processing, and that is ending in the, in the trade. So we actually have the agri-food sector value chain, which is only not only the agricultural sector. And estimates is showing in, the, uh, in Southern Africa that this contribution is easily between 15 and 20 percent. And we need to make that calc in Namibia to see what is that contribution of the total agri-food sector to the, to the uh, Namibian economy. I want to show this just as the state of the Namibian. We um, have made calculations from the NAU that the formal cash sales uh, in the formal market during 2018 for the agricultural sector, that's cash to the farmer is about 7.5 billion, I think corresponds with your figures. But what in, it's very important that about 80% of that 7.5 billion is being earned by net exporting industries, where, for example, we are produce industries where we are producing in Namibia more than with which we are consuming, and 20% is by net importing industries. And we believe it's very important to realize that we need different growth strategies for the net exporters versus net importers. Um, net importers, and that is the, the dairy sector, the poultry sector, the vegetable sector, the grain sector, ETC, we need continuous protection of that, of that sector against unfair competition. International companies can easily close down a sector in Namibia because of our, our, our mere size of the market. What is also important that the net exporting industries, which is the beef and the cattle and the charcoal and the grapes and, and etc., need unrestricted export opportunities for these producers and primary producers to invest in the land in order to produce, to increase production. My last slide. We need urgent actions um, to, to make this happen. And, and as moderator, as you have indicated, as well as Madam Kambinda, we had and we are currently in the, in the worst route and Honorable Kachivivi, we are on the worst route in memory history. We are talking really, this drought is comparing to 1960s, 1930s. We haven't seen this. Farmers which are farming for 50 years haven't seen this. Um, so we need urgent actions and support actions to ensure that primary producers recover after this disaster drought. That, that it would, would need supportive financial models to survive cash flow challenges. For the next three to five years, there would be severe cash flow challenges because farmers have depleted the herds, they need to build up the herds, and there's simply nothing to sell. The second one, we need reinvestment for, for restocking to, in, to get to full production. And, very important moderator, we need alternative income sources to manage our cash flow while herd rebuilding is taking place. 
That is on the short term in the next three to five years. On the long term, we, the, the biggest opportunity in Namibia is to restore our rangelands and to restore the balance between grass and bush. We are a savanna, and that includes include bush and include grass. And we have the, the, the scale I've told to bush, and there's no gr place for grass. And we need to restore that balance between grass and, and bush. And this is, according to, there's 45 million hectares of this land which we need to be restored. And this opportunity for, uh, have an impact on mitigating of climate change as well as an increased production is immense. If, for example, that 45 million hectares, we can only restore 10 million hectares, which will cost about 10 billion, 10 billion Namibian dollars. We are able to, to add about 1 billion Namibian dollars per annum in increased production for cattle, cattle output. If we can increase, restore the balance, increase the output of that land with 5 kilograms of live weight a hectare. And secondly, with that increased cat, uh, cattle numbers, we can double the, export, the, the output of the export abattoirs in Namibia. So there's real, real opportunity. But this opportunity and this benefit is costing 10 billion Namibian dollars. And we need to find that cost balance and an, an analysis and make sure that we are, uh, are doing it in the right, in the, in the right way. Last, the last one. We firmly believe that if we focus as a country on the productive and the primary agricultural sector and we can achieve a productive and a primary agricultural sector, we, will create, we are creating rural jobs. This is what we need to do in Namibia. We reduce migration from rural to urban, to urban areas. And in the agri-food value chain, multiplying of job opportunities is being created in the rest of the value chain. If we don't have primary product, if the primary agricultural sector is not there to produce and we don't have primary product, there's nothing to add value to. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, uh, Ruli, for your five minutes. Uh, Prof, your thoughts? Thank you, Chair. Let me also come up here. I also have uh, four slides. Uh, and I've prepared a 45-minute speech, but as being the only obstacle between yourselves and lunch, I will uh, waiver that speech and um, just refer to my slides here briefly. Uh, now, we are talking about agriculture, we are talking about fisheries, talking about sustainability. So why on earth would one invite a law professor to this forum? Um, I actually would like to take Clement's three pillars here, because these are the three pillars of my uh, professional specialization as a lawyer. I started off as a World Trade Law expert, establishing a chair for the World Trade Organization here in Namibia quite a number of years ago. So the element of trade, of course, in agriculture plays an important role. The second pillar is the social pillar. I had the privilege to be the director of the National Human Rights and Documentation Center at the University of Namibia, bringing in the social element in the law in my particular experience. And the last pillar is the economic pillar, which I have added to my other fields at a later stage in my life, contributing to the fact that I had the privilege to represent Africa on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the last assessment cycle. And I can testify from that experience, and lawyers do testify uh, from that experience. And by the way, I was actually one of, I was actually the only lawyer in a group of 1,200 scientists in that um, committee. But I can testify from that experience that climate change is real. We didn't manage to formulate the political alertness sentence to the extent where we said Africa is the most vulnerable continent. There were opposition groups in the northern parts of the hemisphere that actually insisted that we say Africa is one of the most vulnerable continents, which is not true. Africa is the most vulnerable continent, and as it was mentioned earlier, Namibia is probably the most vulnerable country in Africa, 
when it comes to climate change. Now that brings me to my second slide, like this. When we talk about state of agriculture and climate smart ways towards food security, obviously what is needed is technology, innovation, everything that has been mentioned by the learned speakers um, this morning. But I would like to alert the audience to one thing, and that is my message here, that the role of the law in dealing with aspects of urgency, of emergency, of scarcity, of security, plays a very important role. I personally work at the interface of cl climate policy, informing policymakers on necessary steps to take. I hel help to formulate regulations. I help to formulate Namibia's climate policy, for instance. The law is critical and it should not be underestimated, especially when there is no time to act, and that's what I take from the presentations given. There's urgency to act, and there's also, there are elements of resistance, because as human beings, we are complacent, some of us are complacent, we do not always want to engage to change, we want to stay the way things are. And in this context, the law is a very important instrument. An instrument that is not only reactive in nature, as we know it from the application before the courts, you do this and then you go to jail, but it can be proactive as well. Whereas you say, you want to achieve climate smart agriculture? Good. Now we take your word for it. Here's a stick, here's a carrot and the law will help you to achieve what you want to achieve. Because if you don't, then there are consequences. Talk is cheap, but money pays for whiskey. And in that sense, I'm very, I'm very um, proud of this achievement here, which is a book that I've started to edit almost 10 years ago with the support of the Hans Seidel Foundation, with the support of the Minister of Environment, compiling all the laws and policies relevant for the protection of the environment in Namibia. Land, water, fisheries, oceans, soil degradation, name it, it's in there. We are proud to work on the fourth edition, which is going to come out next year. It's almost 600 pages. And it was mentioned earlier that Namibia has obligations towards the global community. United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNCCD, Convention on Biological Diversity. Namibia is one of the few countries in the world that has an article in its constitution, and that is Article 144, and you should read it, where it says that un unless otherwise stipulated in this constitution, international law is part and parcel of national law without further transformation. So in the context of climate change being a global phenomenon, a global case of urgency. Every country has committed towards the Paris Agreement and also its national, develop, its national uh, um, um, commitments towards the Paris Agreement. And these commitments are going to be benchmarked. And in order to achieve those commitments, the law, both national regional, SEDEC, continental, African Union law, and international are posing obligations to the government of Namibia, to the industry of Namibia, to the people of Namibia. Because Sect. Article 95 of the Constitution says 
it is upon the government to protect the ecosystems and make them sustainable in the interest of present and future generations. If we fail to do that, we have failed. And the law is going to help to address this issue. And I hope that we're going to circulate this publication widely in order to sensitize the population, not only the people sitting in law firms, in ministries, you know, driving big cars, but also trickling down to the population on the ground. And I think even the local communities, the traditional leaders, the women in the communities can play a role to translate these obligations into our daily lives in order to protect Namibia and its population from the worst case scenario. Thank you, Prof. <coughs> Right, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ruppel. Um, let me start with uh, the Ministry of Water, uh, Agriculture, Water and Forestry, uh, Madam Mildred Kambinda. I am passionate about water because of the role it plays in de-risking the country from droughts. What are some of the plans that government through the ministry has to try and de-risk the country of the droughts that we have? So if you can, you can start with you, Madam Kambinda. <coughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, as you might realize, we are two of us. The part on water is actually well dealt with with my colleague, but perhaps I can talk a little bit on the agriculture part. When uh, Mr. Hailwa takes charge, he will definitely highlight a, a lot on the water component. Uh, I, I know a, a, a quite a big proportion, but I would like to do injustice to that question, which is coming for the sake of the audience. Mm -hmm. Uh, being a department or uh, a person on the uh, agriculture department. Uh, indeed, water is one of the key priorities of the ministry. But I would like to drive your, to draw your attention to the agriculture component, which is also dependent on water. And perhaps allow me to say that uh, when it comes to Namibia, due to the scarcity of water, and uh, indeed due to uh, the erratic rainfalls, which everybody has echoed here, uh, uh, our key component is actually to engage ourselves in irrigation. Irrigation for agriculture, water for agriculture, at all levels uh, of the farming sectors. Uh, I think it's well-known fact that the ministry has been uh, uh, spearheading the green scheme, uh, green scheme uh, uh, development, which is actually a large scheme, uh, irrigation schemes across the country, uh, which are, you know, uh, primarily uh, a, a big investment of the ministry. One of the biggest chunks of our budget is actually water for agriculture. And uh, at these farms, it's the reason why we invest in these farms is because of the fact that uh, agriculture is risky. If we don't irrigate, then we don't get food. Uh, deliberately, we invest money in having serviced land with water, where both commercial and mentored farmers, that is now the small-scale farmers, do produce for uh, the benefit of the farmers. Uh, having said that, uh, I just want to also say that uh, plans are underway for small-scale uh, horticulture farmers. We are all familiar with the fact that uh, small-scale horticulture farmers have had very little support in the past, uh, but plans are also underway to engage them. 
uh, and bring them in the mainstream uh, agriculture uh, as funds are available. But of course, we are aware that uh, our economy is not very much on the good side. But this is not to say that we are doing nothing about it. We are actually starting uh, to get into this. Uh, I, I don't know whether I can zoom on further. Yeah, uh, I, I think maybe we can hold it there for yes. now. Mm -mm. Uh, Mr. Hailua is still around? He's here. Okay, so yes. after the next question, maybe you can just join us here. Yeah. You can speak, I'll ask you about water. I'm very passionate about water. Yeah. But in the meantime, uh, Ruli, um, I mean, you did mention the importance of uh, primary uh, production, uh, primary agriculture, and uh, how that is important to, of course, employment creation, uh, income generation, stemming rural urban migration and all the other things. Uh, but in terms of being climate smart, how climate smart are we in our agricultural practices as, as, as a country? And what is it that we actually need to do to transition our farmers completely to adopting cli climate smart uh, practices? Mr. Moderator, um, yeah, in terms of climate smart, I've tried to mention that the biggest impact we can have in terms of mitigating climate change is, is addressing our biggest obstacle of, of, of production, uh, which is bush encroachment. And if we need to restore that balance, we can do that. That is the best way for an agricultural sector which is 60%, more than 60% dependent on extensive rangelands in the country. We have more than 60 million hectares of rangeland in the country. If we are able to restore that rangelands, we have immense opportunities to increase output in order and also to, to better manage, be able to manage droughts. Uh, because we simply have, have a, a balance between grass and bush and thereby we have a lower risk and we have a ability to grow our sector of that. That is, that is the most important one, I think, in terms of extension, extensive rangelands we have. The second one is utilizing, utilization of water, um, which is very important and because water in a mobile will also always be a scarce resource. Um, and my personal belief is that this, this water needs to be utilized for producing food in terms of food for animal for humans food for humans high value crops like horticulture as well as long term crops citrus export crops and not being used to produce fodder because we have 60 million hectares of rangelands which we can use for fodder for our livestock mm -hmm. we can you must use the scarce resource to produce in a in a climate smart way with drip irrigation with the best technologies high value crops horticultural products and food for the nation mm. right so everything depends on water. So, Mr. Hailua, at once I hear there is scarcity of, of water in Namibia, but I also hear there is the sea, there is big aquifers in various places. And, you know, we are consistently faced with drought. So what are the plans of government to really try and help mitigate the risk of drought by ensuring that we bring the water out from wherever it is and at least be resilient to the climate. Uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you, listeners and viewers. Um, think, uh, there are two things we, we have to address. Uh, one is to admit that uh, the nature is not in our, in our side when it comes to water supply. Um, it's, it's a very difficult uh, a, a situation we find ourselves in. But um, as a government, we have started with the uh, development or constructing large dams. Uh, we have a good example uh, over the past three, four years at uh, Nekatar Dam. Uh, I think uh, it is now uh, a well-known fact that uh, it is completed and the uh, water supply in the southern regions uh, is actually getting to be addressed uh, to a large extent. Um, 
uh, one of those uh, other investments we are looking at is uh, also desalination programs. It is at a high uh, level or a high table of, of the, the committee, uh, National Committee of, of Water Security, which is actually um, uh, uh, under the uh, 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 responsibility of the cabinet. And um, the, there's a lot uh, done to, to achieve that desalination program to supply water along the coast, probably also to, towards the central uh, Namibia. Then um, we also look at uh, infrastructure improvement or construction of, of infrastructure such as uh, improving the canal of uh, Kaluweke or Shakati Canal uh, to, to improve it uh, better and even to reduce maybe evaporation. And also um, to consider uh, putting up the, the canal between Kavango and the uh, uh, Fontaine area there, Kavango River. That those are in the uh, middle of the studies and the, in far much advance, and the, it's one of the, 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 the hope that we are going to, to do some solution. Finally, um, let me tell you that um, um, we, we have somehow uh, the arrival of Messiah when it comes to water in Ohangwena. Um, we, it is a, a well uh, established fact that uh, there is a good aquifer and uh, quite promising, and we are also in far much advance to tap that, to, 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 to start uh, drilling uh, deep boreholes where we can uh, supply water from Ohangwena Aquifer to, uh, so that um, um, the, 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 the shortage of water in northern regions will be uh, addressed to some extent uh, in the long term. And uh, uh, we may talk more, uh, uh, Mr. Chairperson, uh, but... Um, uh, those are the few things I can share with the uh, meeting at the moment. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to maybe just open up quickly for, for the floor, if you have one or two comments. The only thing I know is that you can see me. I can't see you. <laughs> All right. So, but I can see uh, Honorable Steve Bezerin out here. And then there's a hand also towards the back. So... Is there a roving mic? Or can we take this one? <clears throat> so if you could just indicate, uh, all right, so we'll take three um, for now. Um, oh, there yeah. is at the back, then here in front, after Steve. So Thank I you. see, yeah. My name is Steve Besaidnot. I'm a member of parliament. My question is basically how do we use smart technologies to gather information? For example, sensors, Arduinos and so on, to gather information and put that into a sustainable database for the common use of the whole country in terms of production of policies, plans, actions and implementation. That's my question. Uh, uh, do you have a specific person you want to ask, uh, Steve? Just the, just the panel in general. Okay, the panel. So what I would like to do is take all the three questions, and then I think the panel can tackle them at the back. But maybe on your way to the back, there was one here. Hello. My name is Iria. Uh, we make chicken feet from seaweeds. I just wanted to actually... Mine is a comment, it's not a question. So what currently happened in our country is that we have a lot of graduates and we work in isolation. So what if we get um, artisans that graduated at NIMT to draw up or design hydroponic systems that we can actually supply to households so that they can farm with their own veggies, which they can feed on and also maybe supply to AMTA or other agencies in Namibia to sell. All right, In thank you. In a way, you. we are creating employment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good question. All right, at the back. Thank you very much. My name is Wiebke Volkmann. Listening to the comments on increasing the water availability for growing food, my concern is that we don't have enough awareness around the importance of soil water holding capacity. And that is within horticultural lands, that is within crop fields, that is within our rangelands. And the solutions are very simple, it's keeping soil covered, and that basic principle, I think,
can be um, disseminated in the whole population and amongst our decision makers. My concern is that if we engage too much technology in aquaponics and uh, those sort of technical things, we rely a lot on imports that cost foreign currency and we make ourselves quite vulnerable in terms of economic independence. All right, thank you. And I'll, there was, uh, yeah, on my right hand side at the back there, gentleman with a black cap. Then I'll, I'll give the panel a chance. Good morning, all the protocol observed. I thank you for yeah. the Hans Hedel Foundation for bringing us together. If we can, if My we can question is very short. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's on the issue of drought that we are facing. We all know since 2013, as we have seen there, that our agriculture and we are facing drought. And the other thing, we have rural area, like communal area, like Ovitoto. My name is Jeremy Kasumi, I'm from Ovitoto, sorry. So, this communal area, we know very well, they are very small. And then we have, we face, the farmers are there, facing drought. When it comes to extend them, there is a ministry of, of land. Sometimes when they allocate the farms, they do it in another way which is not right, like corruption. <laughs> then all these farmers end up suffering. And the other question that I want to ask to the Ministry of Agriculture, you say by 2025 we will end hunger. I don't know. I'm seeing today Namibia is exporting food from South Africa. And us as a country, as a Namibian country, we have seen the good example of Spain there, what they are doing. And then also our, our lawyer talk about the law. Yeah. What I, are we doing to yeah, change I, our laws? And what are we... We, the citizens, can also do something, but the question is the Minister of Agriculture, since you are responsible for water, we have underground water, we are there, but every time we are hearing money is returning to the treasury. Are you not interested to help the farmers to get water? Like now in Ovitoto, farmers are suffering, or in other regions also, are suffering, and unfortunately, think cattle have to die while we are here, living, drinking water. Thank you. Right, thank you. Legitimate, very legitimate. Right, a couple of questions for Ministry of Agriculture. You may wish to go first, but any of the panel members can actually add. Okay, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, from agriculture side, I would like to zoom on the question of water holding principles. Uh, that's a, a very important uh, aspect. Uh, among the three principles of conservation agriculture is actually the issue of permanent soil cover. There are three principles there uh, for conservation agriculture. Number one is minimum soil disturbance, that is minimum tillage or zero tillage at all. Uh, the other one is um, permanent soil cover, which covers that aspect of uh, uh, keeping the soil covered to retain water uh, is a very, very important one. The other one is actually crop rotation. Uh, perhaps I would like to highlight the fact that uh, when it comes to uh, permanent soil cover, which is essential for holding water, one of the challenges, particularly among the smallholders or small-scale farmers and notably communal areas, has been the fact that for you to be have permanent soil cover, you must have fencing. You must defense the area so that they, uh, or retain that uh, stover somewhere so that you make it available for covering the crops, for covering the soil during that time of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, cropping time. Uh, otherwise, when a drought comes or dry spells come, what tends to happen, our observation, and that's our weakest link uh, when, at, uh, when it comes to conservation agriculture, what tends to happen is that farmers start beginning whether to retain the stover for the cropping season or to allow the animals uh, to graze in. And so 
where it so happens that instead of building that biomass over the period, it tends to be uh, building in a very slow rate. For those who do practice, and this is an opportunity for me to also create awareness, for those who do practice reserving the stova to cover the, uh, the soil or to avail other mechanisms of covering the soils, the benefits are huge, and they do harvest. We have farmers this year who harvested because they actually covered the, 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 the soil. We have those type of farmers. And nearby farmer who did not have measures of retaining the moisture harvested nothing. Uh, Madam Kambinda, yes. um, I think the, the concern was mm. general awareness. Yes, how, yes. how are you dealing with that? Okay, <laughs> let me go uh, move on to the general uh, awareness aspects. We have various trainings which we undertake across the country, notably the crop gro growing areas where we train uh, farmers on these three principles I've just talked about, including the issue of uh, uh, awareness on uh, soil cover. We do this not only by virtue measure of talking in a classroom, or, but we actually do, pra do practicals and have demonstrations across the country. Mm -hmm. For those who have visited MADI, this Mashare uh, Agriculture Development Institute, you will realize that we have on station these measures. And you, some of us had the opportunity to see, those of us who did not visit physically, we had the opportunity to see on Green Horizon they made the, the, how the crops were looking, simply because of having this demonstrated. So we are creating this awareness through the media, through demonstrations, and we are actually cooperating with our partners, such as the FAO, uh, the GIZ, in, including academia, they are also incorporated in uh, creating this awareness and the researching because technology is not a one size fit all. We want technologies adapted to Namibia and we would like to know to what extent can we retain moistures and all other, the other technologies. Right. So academia are on top of things working with us towards that. Thank we you. do also create meetings and the advisory services in that regard. You have touched my core. So I'm tended, I'm, I, I tend to speak more on that area. Yeah. So there's various capacity building uh, ongoing at the moment. But my call, just the last one, is that, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it should be a mouth, you know, stakeholder approach. And this is what we are trying to do. With conservation agriculture, we have a national forum and we also have regional forum where all stakeholders invo involved in agronomy do meet to strategize on what to do each season. Come November, we are also undertaking the same in the crop gro growing areas. Yeah, no, thanks, Sorry for thanks, taking Thanks very much. The, yeah. uh, do you, or is it Mr. Hairwa, would like to speak on... Uh, there were a couple of questions raised from Ovitoto, so... So if we can just try and get to the core quickly. Yes. Um, once again, colleagues, um, we, we should do, um, accept the reality that um, uh, there's much can be done to save the situation, but also there's much uh, must be done to accept the situation. That, uh, uh, yes, it's like that. And nature is like that. Uh, Obitoto... Um, we have a, a, a task to balance that. How, how many boreholes do we drill at a given time uh, so that we secure also the underground uh, water level? So that um, um, if, if we, we drill too many boreholes, uh, maybe we may also damage the underground aquifer uh, to, to, to extend that we may not uh, recover it again. But. Um, we, we supply uh, water according to the amount of, of water uh, we have available. Um, yes, there might be some room to improve, but um, uh, what is critical is for us to uh, also manage on our livestock number. If we know that uh, uh, Ovitoto is, uh, is a place with a lot of mountains and the holes, 
uh, we may not really keep a big number of cattle and they will expect some miracles to come when he, the drought comes. We must uh, understand those things. But uh, all in all, if there's anything to be done to improve the number of boreholes and maybe to, to drill them a bit deeper, that can be done. Uh, but uh, um, we, we, we should also uh, accept those uh, reality of nature. I thank you. Right, thank you. There, there was, uh, I think, a, a comment as well uh, from the lady from Seaweeds. Um, I don't know if anybody want particularly to respond to that and also a technology question from Honorable Bezaidenhout. Ruli. Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to respond to the question of the Honorable Member of Parliament in terms of the smart, te smart technologies. Um, the, uh, according to uh, information, there is already these technologies available in the world uh, which can provide information to land users on good principles of land management on whatever information you want to provide directly to the user, as well as to gather, to gather information from the land user to policy makers, to make informed policy decisions, which is a sustainable decision to the benefit of the land user. I think the challenge is that we need to adapt these technologies for Namibian circumstances, where a land user can use his cell phone and, and and get access to information everywhere in the world. And we need, but we need to adapt that technologies for Namibian, for the Namibian circumstances. Right. Anyone wanting to comment on working together? From the lady from Seaweed. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. I tried to listen very hard. Iria. Iria. Any particular comment on that? I think it was more a comment than anything. Maybe Dr. Carrillo, I had cut you short a a earlier. Is there anything in one minute that you would like to, to add? <laughs> Sorry, I don't understand the yeah, is, is there anything you would like to add? Your time was short when you presented. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would like to say in addition to what you have already said? Yeah. Uh, not really. Uh, um, uh, the agriculture is very complex, uh, uh, and the farmer, uh, for, example, for example, in my region and in Spain, the the, the mind of uh, of these people uh, is very complicated, mm. and it's not easy to to improve. Because, for example, you can put uh, rules. A lot of we have a lot of rules, European Union rules, and Spain Spain uh, rules and local rules, but a uh, farmer uh, need to produce and sometimes don't agree with, with these rules and it's very difficult that this, uh, this farmer apply these uh, rules. Mm. Sometimes said, okay, this rule is very, is, in a paper is, is very good, but I can apply this because you can, you, you don't ask me it's possible, it's not possible, mm. uh, it's possible to do mm. better. So I think it's very, very important to uh, cooperate, cooperate it. Mm. all the stalker, uh, I mean, the government, mm. the, the regional government, mm -hmm. the local government, mm -hmm. uh, technician, of course, and law, lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, agriculture, uh, agriculture uh, association, uh, cooperative, uh, other kind of uh, companies, farmer, uh, of course, uh, some uh, 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 groups uh, for environment. All we have to design the future, mm -hmm. not only the government or not only uh, the farmer do that uh, that uh, they like. We have to to coordinate. Uh, in order to, to improve our agriculture and uh, the sustainable of this activity. Right, thanks very much. Prof. Rupal, can I give you the honor of closing the discussion? Oh, thank, thank you very much, Chair. It's a great privilege. Um, a lot has been said. Um, I would just like to briefly tap on the last speaker when he talked about nonsensible rules. Um, Namibia has a pristine legal environment. If you look at the acts applicable, the policies on the ground, 
They're pretty comprehensive. Some of them may have to be adjusted to change. Some of them may be outdated. We have in inherited them from the lawmaker from the days of the apartheid. As a matter of fact, there's even one law still in place which stems back to the German colonial days, and that is the Title Deeds Act, by the way, which um, is quite important to understand when we talk about the protection of law, uh, the protection of land in the context of an, an agriculture, is also who owns the land and what obligations uh, derive from the law to protect the land in any course of commercial action. And therefore, I think the organizers of this workshop have done justice to two things. Number one, it is an integrated approach. You can see from the slide here that the organizers are both local, global, international. And I think that is the only way to foster cooperation on the way forward. Integrated on the national level, especially when it comes to issues like climate change, which are so complex, where everything is related to everything. The integrated approach is key if we want to achieve uh, uh, any change from happening. And that's why the various ministries are called upon to sit together and assess also the legal environment, whether it is still up to date or whether there are opportunities available also to attract foreign investment, perhaps, also for global cooperative efforts, but also to just improve the situation on, on the ground. And the emphasis on the competence of the people in the rural communities, the traditional leaders, cannot be overemphasized because it is actually the custodians of the local environment on the farms, in the field, that will be capable to give justice to what we discuss here at a theoretical level. Right. Now, thanks very much. I wish I could have you longer, Madam Kambinda, gentlemen. But thank you very much. This marks the end of our panel discussion. So I hand over to Ronaldo, or Ricardo. I think I'll take the Ronaldo name as well. It's a good christening. Ronaldo is uh, one of the highest paid footballers in the world. So there might be a bit of a pressure on the Kapunda here, but uh, I think we can make do with that. Uh, thank you so much. I understand the time was a bit tight for us, but I think th this naturally goes with events of this nature. Uh, sometimes we underestimate the, the, just the sheer size and the, the amount of substance that each and every topic here carries. Nonetheless, thank you once again for your, for your patience. And I think I'm really, really happy in terms of I didn't hear a single cell phone ring since we started with the morning session. And that really, really is a, is a good indicator of your professionalism. Nonetheless, we're going to have lunch in the Acacia at the Safari Court, uh, right on the other side of the building. As you step out of here, you will receive uh, your uh, cards so you can be able to access the lunch area at the Acacia. Also, just a reminder, all the speakers, uh, as after you're done removing your, your microphones, please make a turn outside on the immediate right-hand side, the, the exit there, make use of that, and then you can go to NMH because they want to have uh, one or two interviews with you as well. Also, a reminder that we are streaming this live on Facebook as well as on Twitter. Uh, so that is, of course, for us to make sure that we have broader participation also from the public um, at home because we could not obviously fill everybody in, which is a stakeholder uh, in natural resource management. So on Facebook, of course, the link is available. Just search uh, for Hansara Foundation. Uh, the Namibian, of course, is a newspaper. And uh, I think the Namibian Sun are also carrying it 
on their platforms on the website as well as their Facebook pages. So please do make sure to visit there as well. The official hashtag is uh, SRMConf19 uh, for those of you that will be tweeting. We'll have the lunch uh, for about 40 minutes and then in 40 minutes we are going to reconvene back here in this venue. Thank you so much. We are about to break for lunch um, at this very important conference on sustainable management of natural resources and uh, we will be right back within the hour. Thank you to every one of the viewers who has been sharing watch parties and our live feeds. Please continue to do so once we return. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>